Yeah? We're good? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> um, so, a, a very good morning. A very good morning, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Başak Çalı. I'm the director of the Center for Fundamental Rights here at the Herti School. And I'm delighted to welcome you all uh, to our symposium today uh, on constitutional challenges judging under pressure. We have an excellent uh, panels uh, and uh, wonderful speakers. Uh, we will uh, be having some very important conversations uh, which we have started uh, yesterday at Humboldt University. Um, as our president told you yesterday, this is a very young institution in Berlin. Uh, it's only 20 years old. It's celebrating its 20th anniversary this year. It uh, aims to be an interdisciplinary and international um, and um, uh, open space for debate and discussion about the challenges that we face uh, in um, government and governance um, in Berlin, in Europe, and also internationally. And the Center for Fundamental Rights was inaugurated in this room um, exactly four years ago, and we were um, honored to have uh, Professor Susanna Baer as one of our uh, keynote speakers. And four years ago, we talked about whether fundamental rights were losing ground in the world. And it seems like that discussion is also exceptionally timely um, four years later. I'm uh, going to give the uh, floor uh, to my co-organizers. Uh, we are a, a big group of organizers for this event uh, across uh, different universities. Uh, but before I do that, I will give the floor to um, Professor Nora Markard. Let me just thank everyone who's been putting these events together in the past year or so. This has been a long time in the making event. Um, let me just uh, thank again uh, uh, Dr. Michael Kramer, who's uh, been absolutely crucial in putting the event together, and also uh, Naomi Hishman and Jimena Cortez, who has also been working very hard. So also warmly thanking again all of our speakers and panelists and esteemed guests today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bashak. My name is Nora Makad. I'm a professor at the University of Münster, and it is my it is an absolute delight to be here at Hattie School. Thank you for hosting us uh, today with this event. Um, we have, as you all know, had a disruption yesterday. It's very sad that um, we were not able to continue the conversation as planned in the auditorium. I am all the more thrilled that we managed to improvise a very thoughtful and enriching conversation um, as part of the reception. And I thank all of you for staying around for that and engaging um, in such an um, open and um, committed way. I really hope that we can continue in the spirit of that conversation today. And um, Constitutional Conversations was the working title of this entire conference. And as you see, we have placed you at round tables, they're not completely round, I admit. Um, but the idea is that you will also speak to each other, that you will open up um, your conversations, step outside of your little friendship bubbles of professional relationships, and engage with all these fantastic people in the room, um, some of which will always be up here. So this is a series of round tables. Um, we will have very short um, introductory statements from our speakers. Um, each uh, roundtable will be chaired by one of our speakers as well, and we'll open up very quickly um, to the uh, joint discussion in the entire room, including those who are up here. So I really invite you to um, see how you will contribute to this debate and um, contribute your perspectives and your experience and your expertise. Um, with that said, um, we're delighted to have a fantastic keynote speaker, and I'll hand it over to Catherine to introduce her properly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Bashak and Nora. Um, my name is Catherine Costello. I'm the former co-director of the center, and uh, I'm now based at University College Dublin. Um, Reflecting on four years ago, uh, dear Susanna, we were so honored when you came to launch this Center for Fundamental Rights at the Herty School. Um, and I had a concern about the panel that night, which was that there wouldn't be enough disagreement. And I thought that would make for a very dull panel. And Susanna, you said these very wise words in the ante room, and I hope you don't mind if I repeat them, but you said, I spend my days disagreeing with people. 
it's okay if we all agree about human rights sometimes. <laughs> and I thought, okay, well taken. So uh, the panel was full of lively disagreement in, in a good way. Uh, but here at the Hertie School in my teaching and elsewhere, uh, and very much learning from Professor Challa, we always included in our diversity statement, let's aim to disagree without being disagreeable um, and holding the space for difficult conversations. Um, and I think, uh, in a way, we were able to do that yesterday. And today's event, which is live streamed, uh, and so please speak into mics during the day when you have uh, comments to make, uh, we hope we'll be you know, doing something very special because having the combination of academics and judges and judges who are also academics is uh, really something exquisite and unique. Um, and so I'm very proud to be one of the organizers. I'm also immensely proud to uh, introduce the keynote speaker, Professor Catherine McKinnon, who's Elizabeth um, A. Long, Professor of Law at the University of Michigan, and James Barr Amos, Visiting Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. Uh, if like me, and at least one other person in the room, you studied in University College Cork in the 1990s, one read a lot of Catherine McKinnon's books. Uh, due to the wonderful uh, genealogy of feminist legal scholarship and activism, our feminist leading light at the time, Professor Caroline Fellon, insisted, or not insisted, but encouraged and introduced her ideas to us at that time. Um, and they were very impactful. Um, she is a lawyer, a teacher, an activist, and a writer on sex equality issues, both domestically and interna internationally. And I think that ability to span the domestic and the international is also one of the really striking hallmarks of her career. Her dozen books have been widely published in many languages. As we know, she conceived of sexual abuse as a violation of equality rights, pioneering the legal claim for sexual harassment as sex discrimination in employment and education. And with Andrea Dworkin, she recognized the harms of pornography as civil rights violations, and also proposed the Swedish model to abolish prostitution. At the international level, from 2008 to 12, she was the first special gender advisor to the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. Her approach to equality has been largely accepted in Canada and elsewhere, including at the international level, and representing Bosnian women survivors of Serbian genocidal sexual atrocities, she established the legal recognition of rape and genocide. She works with the ERA Coalition and the Coalition Against Trafficking Against Women. Uh, what a career of impact and scholarship. So it's a great honor to introduce to you Professor Catherine McKinnon. Good morning, everyone. I am amazed to be here um, and delighted to have been given this precious space of time with you all at this very special event. Um, thank you to Susanna Baer for thinking of me uh, to, to be doing this, and to all of you uh, who have come so far, as well as those of you uh, who have come from right here, uh, from the Hertie School and from uh, Berlin and uh, closer in. Um, I'm calling these thoughts uh, three crises or saving the world, uh, which uh, I see to be uh, the task that Susanna Baer has pitched us today. Um, taken together, our triad of topics, equality, democracy, climate, uh, to each of which, actually, of course, as you all know, the incomparable Susanna Baer has made major contributions, uh, represents a troika rushing toward apocalypse. I was struck, actually, last night by how many of our speakers recognized the situation of crisis that we're in, in all of these. I, I've never been to a really high-level conference where everyone just calmly did that, you know, as integrally to their... Uh, comments. Um, what I think we're seeing is inequality increasing exponentially within and between nations, authoritarianism metastasizing with the rise of despots worldwide, and the natural world hurtling toward an irretrievable, unlivable abyss. 
these interconnected dynamics will be stopped at the precipice in our lifetimes, perhaps actually in this decade, or not at all. The problems that they pose interact, as do their potential solutions. They are driven and controlled by the same people for the same interests, by some of the same mechanisms toward the same ends against many of the same people. They sweep from the personal group and communal sphere through social, civic, political, and institutional terrain to the planetary physical ecosystem, both natural and man-made. Constitutional courts and the judges that sit on them can have a key role in each of them. I will focus for your further consideration on this unique day on some of those intersections, in particular, on the role that equality, a constitutional value or guarantee in most countries, and an aspiration in democracies, has or could have, first, on its own, second, to preserve or extend democracy as a political system and make it newly meaningful, and third, to retard or repair the climate change that threatens all of us, but not all equally or equally soon. Beyond all of this can be seen the treatment of inequality in constitutional and wider theories, doctrines, and conversations, which in turn foregrounds the potential illumination and guidance that substantive equality, a philosophical and theoretical concept, as well as a legal and jurisprudential tool can provide to each area. My central thesis and through line this morning, sketched on an expansive but necessarily compressed canvas, is that substantive inequalities, meaning structural, collective, dynamic, social, hierarchical domination and subordination, within and between polities characterizes inequality as such, that it has challenged and is undermining democracy within nations and in the international order, and has supercharged climate change and made it difficult to impossible to stop or reverse it. Equality, understood substantively, however, embraced by constitutional courts, I contend and urge you to consider, can end social inequality. It can contribute powerfully to reversing democratic deficits, at least retarding both the dynamics of democratic decay and climate catastrophe. So formal versus substantive equality and what I mean by that. The conventional approach to equality, still largely adhered to in most countries and in the European system, is the formal Aristotelian one of sameness and difference, of treating likes alike, unlikes unalike. As a legal doctrine in structurally unequal societies, actually none of that was what Aristotle had in mind, um, it proves remarkably resilient as well as uninquisitive about the determinants of what it terms differences on a likeness, which are overwhelmingly produced by the deprivations built in to the social hierarchies that it produces. Likewise, it fails to specify or inquire into the reference of its standards for sameness, the likeness, which it fails to notice involve those same indulgences and privileges that are endemic to hierarchically superior social locations. Hence, many of the qualities permitted to the people who occupy those positions. Absent this inquiry, it builds in and imposes its view of natural hierarchy. In its circular, essentially tautologous closed system, its effects are considered its causes and pointed to as its justifications. Now, in case you ever wondered 
why we have had a century or so of equality law and no equality, even increasing inequality, you might start here. Take sex as one familiar example, the inequality of half the human race to the other half, roughly. Methodologically, this formal equality approach, confronted by allegations of sex inequality, searches society for sex-based distinctions that correspond to a claimed legal or policy inequality. And if it finds one, it thinks it has found a sex difference, not a sex inequality, hence no sex discrimination. It calls this, it's, this method, uh, this correspondence of discriminatory law or policy to discriminatory life, reasonable or sometimes proportional. The purported emptiness of the content of this principle, its abstraction, is regarded as its primary virtue. Systemically, this analysis of equality imagines that liberty or freedom is a completely separate question, when much unfreedom is a result of systemic inequality, and much of what is considered freedom is a habitual, customary, or legally entrenched practice of the domination of some over others, inverting which, that is, which groups are superior and inferior, but keeping the hierarchy in place is not an improvement. It imagines dignitary violation as a wholly separate problem as well, rather than most of it being a measure of the damage done by enforced status inequality. It casts hate as an emotional outburst of misguided group identification, a subjective attribution of motive, rather than an objective expression of outraged hierarchical superiority that then imposes inferiority on its targets to restore a sense and reality of its supremacy. Genocide, too, is considered something apart rather than being an extreme of enforced inferiority, the destruction of a group as such being the final practice of inequality. Equality's doctrinal form, as widely adopted or paralleled in world constitutions, is often predicated originally on US equality jurisprudence, which is not actually a good place to start if you observe its outcomes. Equality law is thus constitutionally typically divided into its forms, the forms that US racist history and resistance to it have produced. The primary form is facial or explicit discrimination as if inequality with as if inequality with a trait or group name on it is the most real or pervasive or worst or hardest to stop. Is it, do you think? Its secondary form is termed impact discrimination, which requires distinctions to be discriminatory, be facially neutral, but affect groups differently, when often these distinctions aren't facially neutral to start with. Sexual harassment as both or neither form shows one instance of the lack of fit between this doctrine and discrimination's realities. Criminalized abortion is another potential example. Forms of impact discrimination are termed indirect discrimination or adverse effect and are considered second class discrimination and are always under pressure, whereas facial or the first kind, the, the denial of sameness is considered first class equality. So attempts to correct for the intrinsic bias in this approach, such as against pregnancy, say in the United States, which is not, by the way, facial discrimination, amazingly, or biased test results can be termed positive discrimination uh, or affirmative action when what they actually are is doing something about inequality for a change or relief, they aren't discrimination at all. Substantive equality theory, by contrast, rather than beginning with abstractions like sameness or difference, begins with concrete hierarchies, 
substance. Now, specifying the substance of the inequality is typically left out. Most writers on the subject, and this includes judicial ones, assume that e substantive equality is just another word for disparate impact or adverse effect doctrine finally being applied. Actually, it is an entirely different approach. It asks first whether a challenged regularity is a practice of structural domination. Does it enforce social inferiority and disadvantage of some and social superiority and advantage of others over them? Does it participate in, reinforce, reproduce, or promote group-based hierarchy? This approach recognizes that no human group is actually inferior or superior to another, that groups are human equals, inaccurately organized, and treated as socially unequal on concrete grounds. Equality here is fundamentally not a value, but a fact, a fact denied its realization in social, political, and legal life. Legally, substantive equality was first accepted in Canada. It's actually embodied in some respects in some far-seeing language in the German Grundgesetz. It has been embraced in some parts of the international system, including soft law, and is predicated as to sex, for example, on leaving androcentrism behind, moving away from notions and practices of masculine superiority, also termed male dominance, toward an embracing sex and gender equality within manifold diversity. Instead of requiring, say, race-based recognitions be the same for all groups, regardless of their situated social inequalities, it inquires, for example, into white supremacy. Diversity as institutionalized in affirmative action, for instance, is a non-Aristotelian value in that it treats unlike persons alike on the basis of their unalikeness, which has put it on thin ice for decades. In contrast with the recent US majority opinion in the Students for Fair Admissions case, which is uh, not actually about fair admissions and has few students as members or plaintiffs, um, which invalidated race-based affirmative action in US <laughs> higher education on a colorblind analysis, which is the perfectly Aristotelian approach, Justice Sotomayor's dissent in that case is animated by a firm and undergirded by a firm grasp of white supremacy. She exemplifies there a substantive analysis of the realities that affirmative action moves against. A similar substantive grasp of reality animates the equality dimension of the German Constitutional Court's decision on welfare and existential benefits of foreign, for foreign nationals. Approaches to prostitution clarify this distinction. Under Aristotelian equality, since men as well as women, so-called sell sex, really actually mostly are sold for sex, and most legal systems criminalize both those who are bought and sold and those who buy and sell them, prostitution is not considered an institution of sex-based discrimination nor are disproportionate arrests of women, including trans women, in prostitution compared with their buyers and sellers, who are disproportionately men so designated at birth. When legalized across the board, as in Germany, still, and New Zealand, for instance, these legalized systems are not considered gender-based persecution, for example, although the drastically gender-skewed numbers of people pulled into the flesh market with well-documented attendant violent harms increase dramatically under legalization. Under decriminalization, so do other crimes against humanity, such as enforced prostitution, sexual slavery, and sex trafficking. A substantive equality approach to prostitution by distinction begins with recognition of the place of coercively enforced sex on women and girls, 
coupled with feminized and racialized poverty, such that material inequality makes it difficult, if not impossible, for most women to earn an independent living. Prostitution, which metastasizes on legalization, is an intrinsically sex, age, race, and gender unequal practice, largely contingent on class and caste. Disadvantaged racial, ethnic, national, and religious groups in every society are massively overrepresented in the sex trade, making it clearly biased on a substantive equality intersectional analysis. It is a massive engine of social inequality, feeding on it and reproducing it, including through sex trafficking, meaning third-party exploitation of prostitution. Once the reality is recognized that on average over 90% of those in prostitution worldwide are pimped. By contrast, the Nordic or equality model, which decriminalizes the bought and sold and strongly criminalizes the demand, the buyers, as well as the sellers, that is, an asymmetrical approach to an asymmetrical reality, takes a substantive equality approach. The South African Constitutional Court's decision in Jordan exemplifies this distinction. The majority taking the formal equality approach and the brilliant dissent by Sachs and Kate O'Regan taking a far more substantive one. While treating sex formally under gender neutrality results in the same treatment of hierarchical unequals, often increasing the inequalities between them, in other words, you treat the the above and below the same, you may raise the floor some, but the gap between them stays the same or even can increase. Treating sex equality or sex inequality substantively results in the Nordic or equality model equalizing against an unequal reality. Now I think if you think about this distinction that many groups and advocates including in the climate emergency space also reproductive rights increasingly use the term equity instead of equality for their end state vision because they perceive that the conventional formal equality model, which is sold as if sameness defines the, the laws of equality the way gravity defines the laws of physics, sells their transformative goals short. Substantive equality, though, in fact, provides everything that they're looking for, along with a legal basis for achieving it constitutionally that the term equity in general fails to provide. So from our discussions last night, one could reflect further on this uh, and suggest that a substantive equality approach, you would wanna ask, is the substantive equality approach that I've offered here political? And the formal equality approach, not. In other words, just legal. Um, I think we might consider that formal equality builds in the status quo politics and that substantive equality permits a shift in those politics toward a more equal situation. That is, if the political is defined as power structured relationships, as I define it, then both of these approaches embody a politics, just different ones. So now, democracy and authoritarianism. Uh, equality is built into democracy as a value, uh, but by no means have democratic countries ever really been characterized by substantive equality as a fact. Democracy is a term commonly used to describe countries that have elections, for political leadership that meets certain minimal standards. Democratic blacksliding is real, but it is sliding back from a benchmark that contains deficits, deficits already, such that democracy has never really been achieved. Political science, actually my field as well, 
um, has long documented that most people who can don't vote in many countries, and many people and communities who want to and try to vote are either not permitted access or live lives that don't allow it. And it's also shown that the policy preference of even preferences of even those people who do vote are largely not systematically reflected in the policy outcomes that are created by the people they elect. So, yo, <laughs> uh, the substantive deficits of democracy within democracies need to be faced. Access to the franchise and its exercise, for one measure, is ever more challenged in most places, including in the US, where voting rights are being vitiated. So let the people decide is all too convenient as a judicial back, backstop when voting, they've already vitiated voting rights, okay? Constitutional and statutory approaches to this problem, which had been quite strong historically, are collapsing case by case in the US. A substantive equality approach to voting rights would strengthen them considerably. Another way of putting this point is that the failure to address substantive equality socially, politically, and in election law has produced crises in democracy leading to authoritarianism by making it facilely more possible. Much more easy to manipulate. Authoritarian rulers who appeal to the most misogynistic, racist, and ethnically supremacist interests of some groups of voters and mobilize them this way are observably increasing, being democratically elected all around the world, who also threaten judicial independence, which can resist principled rights being made contingent upon voting or power, this being the whole point of a constitution, that your rights aren't up for the vote. So the appeal of rampant, toxic, become lethal masculinity is a largely neglected dimension of such an analysis of despots like this, both domestically and in terms of their foreign policy, another way of describing war. Male dominance also includes the dominance of some men over other men, as well as over all women, sexual politics being what is usually termed politics. Wars, as one expression, are observably started and continued because these men are obsessed with their power, including postures of strength relative to other men, not wanting to look weak, display, and the, so they display and practice masculinity on steroids with murderous results. The relation of demography, that is, who is in power, to equality as a mission in democracy, that is, to what ends power is exercised, is not a perfect relation, but there really is something to it. As pornography increasingly saturates societies, men need to appear sexy by its standards to win elections. Is Biden sexy, do you think? And women are ever more marginalized, stigmatized, denigrated, excluded from raising the necessary funding, and reduced to sexual object status via social media, ever more reduced to second-class citizens, particularly if they identify with and as women, excluding women from democratic representation. Pointedly, how can a cunt be a leader? As this implies, in terms of constitutional challenges to democracy, the law of speech or expression deserves special focus. If it is impossible to stop lies individually, as in libel, or collectively, as in group libel, hate propaganda, or pornography, democracy is undermined. It cannot flourish. I think most people believe that US standards for freedom of speech are a particularly US obsession. This is a true thing. Um, however, and to some extent, other countries also have more robust protections against libel and hate speech, if not as yet pornography. But the technology of the internet, its algorithms, 
and AI were all developed in the context of a U.S. First Amendment. It builds its impunity into this technology. It is way ahead of critical thinking or democracy-preserving tools in its spread of disinformation and social networking of extremist ideologies and the radicalization of bigotry and terrorism that it promotes. When there is no access to accurate information and the airwaves are flooded by propaganda that repeats and escalates, democracy's fragility lies exposed. The problem with the marketplace of ideas is that more money, the most money buys the most speech. Nothing guarantees the truth will triumph in this environment. Goebbels would have had a field day with social media. The abstract notion of freedom of expression has never, other than in the Supreme Court of Canada, its ruling on Keegstra on anti-Semitism, I refer you to, Butler and Little Sisters on pornography, or Germany's laws against Nazi propaganda, and the ICTR's ruling in the media case on genocide, for instance. Those are exceptions. But other than that, we don't have a recognition that freedom of expression is also a substantive and substantively unequal system. In the result, protected free speech under the US model, unbalanced by robust equality considerations, can create an unequal, hostile, threatening, even terrorist social environment. I'm saying free speech can produce inequality, okay? Through rampant anti-Semitism, for instance, and Islamophobia. The model is not neutral. The power to inflict injury through speech is intrinsic to social inequality, which when legally protected, is institutionalized and legitimated. Constitutional courts have the ability, by implementing substantive equality in this area, using tests of harm, not hatred, empirical evidence, not value judgment, reality, not morality, to ensure that inflicting damage and endangering groups is no longer an entitlement called speech. This would powerfully promote a multiracial, multi-ethnic and religious, sex and gender inclusive democracy. It also is clear that constitutions are going to have to come to grips with poverty, with social and economic class as a virulent form of inequality produced by the very economic democracy that capitalism claims to be. The language of most constitutions make this difficult, squarely, although South African constitution, for instance, recognizes it. As to this, as well as with elections, if constitutional democracies do not face any economic inequality in all its gendered and racialized dimensions, democracy contains the seeds of its own destruction in this respect, as well as others. In one interconnected dynamic, this failure provides the opportunity for undemocratic forces and individuals to enhance their popularity and support among the desperately poor by pushing development projects claimed to reduce poverty that in fact escalate climate deterioration, make it more difficult for subsistence and peasant farming, and have differential consequences on the already impoverished. I actually think that if sex, race, and caste inequality were substantively economically rectified, meaning discrimination on these bases was, that is, that, that also is connected with income and property inequality was seriously tackled and these grounds are already part of most constitutional equality frameworks, that a massive chunk, massive chunk of class-based inequality would be rectified. The majority of the poorest people are poor on the combined grounds of race and sex and caste as well where that operates. So suppose you address those, that you can do 
You don't have to have a separate ground for class. It's just a massive amount of it. So how much would be left? Lacking this economic inequality within nations and across them is going to continue to increase as it has up to now. This is both a consequence of a lack of systemic democracy and an indication that it is moving ever further toward conditions, including real deprivations, as well as rising resentments and embittered disappointments that racialist and misogynistic strongmen, sometimes academically euphemized as hyper-presidentialism, nice to have a many-syllable phrase there, almost a Germanic word, um, you know, built up of its perfect small parts, um, are ex they're exploiting this toward fascism. Hmm? As this critique implies, substantive equality institutionalizes the democratic ideal and legal form. It is a perfect place for Daniela Salazar's uh, beautiful phrase, uh, the judicialization of democracy. In the absence of this recognition, democracies haven't squarely faced the role of misogyny. Indeed, the force of stratified unequal social power in all its forms, i.e. substantive inequality, in them. It has never looked at whether male supremacy is integral to democracy, and democracy can flexibly exploit it to its own ends, or whether democracy is or can be a counter to the power of men over women. Clearly, there is no power in numbers, or women of color and their children would run the world. If a de democratic deficit can be built into democracy itself, in institutions intrinsically designed to be so fragile against the forces of cynical autocracy, as they are proving, and actually I think corruption is one crucial nexus uh, of, its con of democracy's concealed masculinity. If democracy as designed can promote its own decay, then democracy is on an extinction curve. The rule of law will be impotent against it. But until that moment, constitutional courts armed with substantive equality can be a countervailing force to strengthen its core equality principle against democracy's annihilation. So now environment. This is called where the first was formal versus substantive and the second part was called democracy versus authoritarianism. This is called the environment against the Anthropocene. So the damage done to the human relational and governing space is intimately connected to the human destruction of the globe's physical space. Looking at the extinction trajectory through a substantive inequality lens reveals how social and political inequality has contributed to producing disastrous climate change, the ecosystem destabilized through industrialization, colonization, and the exploitation of resource extraction and use of fossil fuels that fuels greenhouse gases, thus global warming under capitalist incentives, and has stymied addressing it. Those who have benefited in comfort and profit from the processes that produce climate emergency are mainly, surprise, the elites of the global North and West. Its harms, disproportionately and sooner, afflicting the global South and East, China being something of an exception to this description. As with inequality generally, when it is institutionalized in democratic deficits, those people and areas with the least power exploited the most are detrimentally <clears throat> affected <clears throat> the most severely and the soonest, including by environmental racism within countries and on the, on the basis of their poverty, age, sex, and gender, indigenous status, and disability. The possibilities of stopping climate change short of further rising temperatures above pre-industrial levels, that is, below 1.5 degrees Celsius per the uh, 2015 Paris Accords, which is bringing sea level rise, catastrophic storms, and ocean acidification along with it, 
is exacerbated by the same imposed inequalities in and among human societies that produce it in the first place. Now, it's worth noting and frequently overlooked that the disasters of the climate emergency affect women disproportionately, typically women of color. Not only are women in, of poorer countries, including small island nations and coastal populations, already in relatively more exposed positions to the floods, droughts, food insecurity, and poisoned fisheries, air, and water, along with the habitat destruction for flora and fauna and agricultural conditions. Women are routinely raped alongside the earth being penetrated for extraction by multinational corporations for resources destined for the West's use in, compo in compounding carbon and other pollution. Women are also more often drowned in its floods because they refuse to flee without their children, animals, or elders. They are caught up and pulled under in the debris fields by their hair. They do not run once their clothes are stripped off for what may appear to be modesty, but actually is fear of rape. If they survive climate disasters like fires or cyclones in refugee camps, and this is also the case when they run from conflicts among men, they become intensively vulnerable to plagues of disease and sexual assault and the ever opportunistic sex traffickers who scoop them up for prostitution. It is estimated that 80% of those displaced by climate-related events are women and girls, although very little is done with this in litigation. Indigenous and Afro-descendant communities experience intensified forced migration pressures from these climate disasters. So as social conditions of inequality escalate the Anthropocene, intersectional human rights of equality, including gender and race, are being wantonly violated. Children are frequently identified by attribution science as the most vulnerable human group to the long-term risks to life and well-being of climate change. One of the most promising constitutional approaches to litigation to stop it is, accordingly, by children claiming the right to intergenerational equity. In this rapidly moving and expanding body of law, I can only highlight a couple notable developments. As to rights as such, it seems actually to need to be said at the top that there is nothing intrinsically individualistic or unstructural about the rights container. The only question is the contents of what is contained within it. Internationally, the intergenerational equality idea tends to arise under substantive or, or under sustainable development and is sometimes linked to it in national cases. Importantly, for constitutional judging, however, a wide range of national constitutions include provisions recognizing the interests of future generations or posterity or rights in perpetuity. An increasing number confer rights accordingly, with some encompassing rights under environmental constitutionalism, that rubric. Sometimes children's rights are invoked as integral to a right to a healthy environment, a heritage of that, with corresponding governmental duties. Sometimes temporal considerations are a guiding principle, often along with the public trust doctrine. So if you haven't heard about all this and you get into it, you'll, you'll see all of these. The ICJ, the European Court of Human Rights, the UN Human Rights Committee, uh, its recent Australia case especially, uh, the, and also notably uh, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, are increasingly being resorted to in this area often after constitutional courts have been tried. So now equity. Although having some international traction, um, and included in the Paris Accords, is, in my view, not a fully adequate legal term for what is needed here, at least in terms of our considerations today, being largely unmoored from most constitutional rubrics, but not all, and I'll mention. Um, and so, too, actually, is US-style equal protection, which is conceptually rigid and mired in this sameness difference business. To the latter, for instance, 
in its complaint, the Juliana case from Oregon, Oregon, which a lot of people have had a lot of hopes for, and you know may live up to them, um, against the U.S. government for facilitating extraction and consumption of fossil fuels, claims a violation of children's rights of equal protection. In this, children are shoehorned into existing equal protection concepts, such as immutable characteristics and insular minorities, when in fact age isn't immutable, obviously, it mutates, and <clears throat> the numbers aren't really the point. Uh, they also there called for strict scrutiny for the group as a suspect class, which would tend to mean, for example, that nothing affirmative could be done for them because strict scrutiny prohibits the legal use of a classification as a form of discrimination. The Ninth Circuit found lack of Article III standing constitutionally in this case so far on the ground that in its view, all citizens will experience the harms of climate change equally as opposed to the discrete and particularized injuries standing requires. Now you will notice that apart from ignoring the differential vulnerabilities, this means that the more widespread an injury is, the less the Constitution can do about it. The overlooked inequality here, as is often true by judicial majorities in these cases, is between those who are inflicting the harm and those on whom it is inflicted. Uh, although climate change affects everyone to an extent, those doing it and who could stop it but so far do not are not those to whom it is most differentially being done. Now, the Supreme Court of Canada might have been expected to have a more substantive equality understanding of children's rights in the climate context. But in the LaRose decision, this was December 13th, 2023, just now, it failed to apply a substantive understanding of the inequality while claiming to do so, this happens a lot, uh, imposed on children and native communities under an adverse effect discrimination analysis. The equality claims there were considered too expansive and diffuse to be compatible with constitutional adjudication and its remedial capacities, as well as unprecedented, not gradual, presenting no present harm to the way equality interests have been understood, overstepping also structural systemic boundaries, although they allow, they, so they don't allow the equality claim to go forward, but they do allow a section seven security interest to go to trial. Now this is frustrating. As this illustrates, one constitutional problem appears to be both these cases uh, with very different uh, concepts of equality potentially that they could draw on, one constitutional problem appears to be claiming an injury and remedy big enough to fit the problem and its solution, that is, a cause of action and the redressability of what the claim is, while not being too big to overstep existing concepts that include various competences structurally, like justiciability or separation of powers. A number of US cases, and there are final decisions pending all across state, a number of states and federal courts, have been mired in similar tensions as are some international decisions. So identifying the right inequality and its content, I think, could help this. Actually, prior, more inspired, conceptually sophisticated and realistic constitutional steps have successfully been taken by the apex constitutional courts, and here I'm just gonna give two examples. Uh, Germany, in the Neubauer case uh, in 2021, and at least I've referred to it as Neubauer because, is, is this okay, do people know what I'm talking about? Okay. Um, and in Colombia, in the tutela of Demanda Generaciones Futuras in 2015. The Supreme Court of Colombia's visionary decision faced, quote, there is a growing threat to the possibility of the existence of human beings, end quote, for which, quote, humanity is responsible, end quote. I do my own translations of Spanish and German, so anybody wants to correct them, you can correct them. It connected the environment with fundamental rights in recognizing, fundamental rights, all right, environment connect fundamental rights, recognizing the principle of intergenerational equity, 
stressing that solidarity with future generations, as they put it, transcends anthropocentrism, and recognized, get this, the Colombian Amazon as a subject of rights itself in guaranteeing a, quote, intergenerational pact, that is, with children, for the life of the Colombian Amazon. This is beautiful. A better way was also posed by what I take to be the remarkable, although very restrained, careful 2021 decision by the German Constitutional Court in Nobauer, on which Susanna Baer sat also. Um, it found an objective duty to pr protect future generations under Article 2.2 of the Grundgesetz, life and physical integrity, together with Article 20a, which speaks specifically of responsibility to future generations to protect the nat natural foundations of life and animals within constitutional limits. In recognizing that these print provisions affect fundamental freedoms and equality rights, which it did, in the context of holding, and this is the context now of, this is the separation of powers and all that, in the context of holding that the legislative and executive powers can come under judicial orders. Okay, so this is helpful on separation of power concepts that lead us to consider judicial restraint, but can also exaggerate it, I think, sometimes, as was observed last night, both. That court, Neubauer, observed that Climate change exacerbates social inequalities, end quote, thus in its decision promoting intergenerational justice. We love that sentence. In a crucial development to watch, okay, and here uh, Judge Ivana Jelic referred to this, um, the Duarte Agustino against Portugal case, these are a couple things, watch these asserts, among other claims, a right to non-discrimination on the basis of age under the European Charter, Article 14, equality, underused, I think, uh, but here claimed, among other things, against 32 countries, as she noted, for shifting the burden of climate change onto future generations, which will worsen over time. It takes, however, a very Aristotelian approach, uh, as is so far disappointing in EU decisions. That final decision likely in 2024, I think. Another crucial development to follow will be the advisory decision in the Inter-American Court of Human Rights in the much more substantively conceived request by Colombia and Chile, um, which extended its, the court extended its deadline for further submissions through mid-December 2023. So they're gonna be having more, but watch that one, I say as well. Substantive equality rights could strengthen these intergenerational arguments. It infuses equity concerns into the equality canon by taking account of the substance of children's inequality. Smaller, weaker, developing, violated sexually and otherwise by dominant adults, typically with impunity, dependent for survival on those same adults, not allowed to work to, learn, to earn an independent living, not allowed to express themselves freely and fully, they can't vote, and they are not able to fully assert their rights independently, rights that are themselves even barely recognized. Now this is true of children right now, intra-generationally, as well as in a forward-looking perspective, intergenerationally, poisoning their present and future when it will be too late. Some of the specific substantive harms to which they are being and will be differentially subjected are devastatingly documented in the petition brought by Environmental Justice Australia to the OHCHR, three separate special rapporteurs on the environment, First Nations, and disability jointly. They cite a, a study finding, and here I quote, a six-year-old in 2020 will experience twice as many bushfires and tropical cyclones, three times more river floods, four times more crop failures, five times more droughts, and 36 times more heat waves compared to a person born in 1960. 
the effects of each of these upon children will be disproportionately damaging, making them sick, interfering with their access to health care, education, shelter, culture, and development, and other guaranteed human rights of the child. As the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights has stated, climate change heightens existing social and economic inequalities, intensifies poverty, and reverses progress toward improvement in children's well-being. Judges, with a substantive record like this, asserting their democratic independence, can face these realities. One Australian judge found this prognosis documented, quote, the greatest intergenerational injustice ever inflicted by one generation of humans upon the next, end quote. Apart from the fact that the harm is already present. When the harm to children is temporarily, temporarily cabined, as many courts are doing, the time will never come when it will be both legally allowed and empirically possible to address the disparity of their situation. That is when the right people to make the equality claim and the right time to make it converge. That's what they're precluding. Conceived substantively, however, Equality compared with equity and formal equality is not just a nice principle or a diverse aspirational notion or a nebulous moral responsibility, but a currently assertable right before constitutional courts, which improves the possibilities also of standing and remedy. And because it's concrete, comparative, and evidence-based, rather than a principle in the air, it is far more justiciable. Applications of substantive equality analysis could expand the judicial imagination toward those novel remedies that the LaRose Court in Canada suggested are required to meet this moment. And finally, empowerment of indigenous peoples, learning from them, colonizer governments working in tandem with them and following their lead offers further possibilities for productively addressing climate change. One consequence of the genocidal European incursions into ecosystems and societies of native peoples worldwide has been the destruction of the land and the sea and of the cultural connection of First Nations peoples to that, along with the impoverishment of the knowledge base for a sustainable long-term habitable earth. The Australian complaint mentioned by the Torres Strait Islanders uh, to the three special rapporteurs, that application, strongly documents violation of the intersectional rights of children within Aboriginal and disabled communities. Equality of original nations within territories that have now other governments superimposed on them this equality can also be supported by constitutional judging, as well as claims by First Nations in the international system, and strengthening the synergy between transnational and national courts and fora on this issue and others moves toward promoting both human justice and mutual survival. As the extraordinary dissent in Juliana put it, the US, and here it is not alone, has reached, quote, a tipping point crying out for a concerted response, yet presses ahead toward calamity, end quote. And as the Neubauer Court and the, Germ and the Human Rights Committee alike recognize, the fact that a problem is international does not absolve nations of their obligations to act. This includes constitutional courts. To be clear, I think I was, but Try it one more time. If we don't solve the climate problem for life on Earth, it won't matter what other problems we solve because there will be no place to live out the solutions. So structurally unequal social power enforces inequality and precludes equality. When it's politically institutionalized, undermines democracy and promotes the destruction of the natural as well as the social and political worlds. I've proposed that substantive equality's recognition could make a real difference in making social and political equality real, 
by embodying democracy in the form of a legal doctrine and implementing it in law as a right, and by empowering at least the mitigation of climate change through slowing or reversing its differential consequences for the young. And make no mistake, if it stopped for them, we stopped it. Through recognizing the reality of substantive inequality, when presented to courts and other fora, power and privilege can be equalized across social, political, and national groups through constitutional means, equalizing representation and efficacy from corporate to political to transnational governance, giving voice to the silenced and excluded, and protecting and restoring the natural environment, walking it back from the brink on which it is teetering. So our three topics present the most urgent interconnected crises of our time. We know what we are facing, and from history and science, we know what acting to stop it requires. With substantive equality as one tool of constitutional law, we have a chance now, not later, to save people and peoples who are already disastrously unequal, to save rule by the people, which is crumbling under attack nearly everywhere, and to save this precious planet for itself, ourselves, and our children. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor McKinnon, for that masterful and rousing uh, tour de force across international and constitutional law and its uh, transformative potential. Uh, so you have very kindly agreed to take some questions. Yeah. Uh, I would invite you to ask your questions succinctly and perhaps introduce yourselves just very quickly. Um, and I'll try to, uh, uh, we'll have about 10 minutes of questions, I think. So would anybody like to start us off? There's some mics going around, so do bear in mind the event is being live streamed, so if you could pose your question into a mic, that would be helpful. Yep, we have someone here. Great. Thank you very much, Professor McKinnon. My name's um, Sam Bookman, and I'm, I'm going to be speaking oh, hi. Um, later today on the... So happy to meet you here. Oh, you too. <laughs> Um, so I'll, I'll be speaking later today on the, on the climate panel, and um, so my question is primarily related to that, but I think relates to the other aspects of your comments as well, which is that your, your address to me conveyed an enormous sense of optimism or faith in legal doctrine and constitutional courts um, to address these issues and that the, the, the shift to a substantive equality approach is something, it's not just a doctrinal shift, but something that has meaning, makes a meaningful difference in the world. Um, and I suppose one of the, one of the react responses to that could be, what, what can constitutional courts do in the face of all this? So I'm wondering whether your suggestion about the shift to substantive equality is a claim about the formal differences that doctrine can have, or whether it says something more about the social or conceptual shifts that are needed more broadly and that might be exemplified by courts rather than driven by them? Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say faith exactly. I think we all have our work to do and that constitutional courts are in a crucial principled location in you know a great many of our nations and uh, have a form of power and a powerful role that they can play. So, uh, and I like to talk to people when I have an opportunity about things they can do. Um, so I, and yes, I do think uh, that this shift can and would and has 
uh, made a meaningful difference where it's been used and can make a meaningful difference. It doesn't mean uh, it's a, some silver bullet. Um, and it isn't just a doctrinal shift, as you nicely point out. Um, it. I'm thinking of actually what Daphna Barakeritz mentioned last night too, having it in mind about the interaction between uh, courts and uh, peoples who are not constitutional judges and law within societies. And they can have, courts can have a kind of leadership function through the legitimacy that they're accorded. Um, and also take in uh, uh, approaches and uh, sort of absorb legitimacy from their polities as well as support that legitimacy and giving it back uh, to, uh, some, to, to, to voices that on a principled basis they judge are deserving of that. And so I see that in a much more dynamic way. You know, you sort of had it going at most kind of in one direction, and did I think? And no, I don't think it only goes in one direction. Um, but uh, having seen courts make a real difference in life, for example, just a simple one, the recognition that sexual harassment uh, is a legal claim uh, as well as, I mean, that it isn't just life. You know, moving it from that space into uh, the, even the possibility of its being actionable. You know, it only took 40 years, but it produced a, a movement of millions of voices across the world recognizing that they're not alone. That's why they called it Me Too, you know? Um, that in itself is something that would never have happened if it hadn't been recognized as being a form of gender-based discrimination. It gave it its foundation. It gave it its forum. It gave it its you know, claim to human rights uh, violation. Um, and it located it within a power inequality that otherwise, again, is just seen as just life. So uh, just as one example, yeah, it, it does matter. OK, my last section was actually called Constitutional Courts Matter. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Professor McKinnon, for, for this uh, wonderful opening keynote speech. And I'm very, very sympathetic to the, the proposal of, of the domestic constitutional courts and all courts having to think a lot more systematically about substantive equality. My question is on the remedies. Um, and I'm interested in hearing a little bit more about, and you have mentioned it in a few places, um, what will be the remedial consequences then you know, rather than the obiter dicta and the recognition that you've highlighted, do you have other thoughts as to what the remedial jurisprudence would look like moving on from the more substantive and the standing ideas that you proposed? Could you say a little bit more about the remedial jurisprudence of substantive equality? Well, sure, um, and those depend on the cases. This is like one of the actually good things about law, that you know people bring real cases to courts and they say, Here's how we've been hurt, and here's what we want you to do about it. So courts aren't just sitting there, um, you know, with no guidance whatsoever on remedy. Um, so it completely depends on what is what the injury is. Uh, but it is so they, ex, you know, part of the justiciability thing is to is is to try to say that. Even if we found there was a violation, we can't adjudicate the doing of what it would take to fix it. Well, I don't think that's right. Um, if you look at, say, even the Juliana case, I mean, look, there are all these, all these, half of these complaints that are out there. Um, they're just asking for the Paris Accords to be lived up to. That's the relief they're asking for, and that is would be substantial. A lot of the governments have committed themselves to it, and some of them are doing it 
sort of. Some of them are pretty well doing it. Some of them are not doing it at all. Um, but that's remedy. How hard is that? You know, it. You, you know, organize. You organize the government such that, uh, you know, it is no longer a, uh, and its policies no longer supporting, as it has been all along, uh, the extraction of fossil fuels and their consumption. Um, there are people whose field this is. I mean, it's not mine, but you know, I've read things. I mean, people know how to do this. This is a doable thing. And, you know, that's seen as some great challenging remedial problem. Well, you know, segregation of the schools on the basis of race in the U.S. was seen as a big remedial problem. They didn't solve it. They should have. They could have. <laughs> they did some things in its direction, but it wasn't that it's unremediable. You know, it, it's sometimes, uh, you know, the remedial follow-through. Right now we have the same virtual index of racial segregation in U.S. schools as we did when it was declared to be illegal. It just isn't enforced by law anymore. Yeah, uh huh. It's, you know, it, and people are trying to figure out how to deal with this, but it's, it's enforced by poverty, actually. It's, in, you know, which segregates housing and schools are community-based in the U.S. So, you know, there you are. But it, always the discrimination is under, it's a shell game, you know, under some different shell. You know, now it's economic and, you know, or now it's educational. You're not educated, so you don't get the good jobs. Well, actually, it's, it's employment discrimination. Well, but actually, you're not educated, so you don't get there. Well, but you're not educated because the housing is segregated, so the schools aren't any good. So, but it's not under there because it's segregated because of, the, of, of employment and and. They don't make as much money, therefore they're poor. So, you know, but, you know, if you see the systemic interconnections, you don't have this problem. But you can address it in housing. You can address it in employment. You can address it in education. Uh-huh. You know, and you don't have to address it all at once if you have a systemic uh, structural approach each time somebody brings a case. So, anyway, it's just an, another example of it. But if you can solve it for you know, inequalities, period, and for climate change, you know, you've done something. And voting rights, similarly. You know, depending on what are the barriers in each system, which vary quite a great deal. Um, Thank you. We have a couple of questions down the back. And if you could keep the questions succinct, we'll get more in. Great. Yes. Thanks. Um, Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Petra Susner. I'm working at Humboldt University uh, here in Berlin. And I also want to pick up uh, on the question of what we can do, and maybe I want to take it a little further. What can we do alongside or beyond courts and cases? And I want to address it on a methodological, maybe a technical level. In two thousand. Uh, no, yeah, in 2019, you published, um, together with Kimberly Grandshaw, an equality amendment. And Susanne Bear brought it up when we were holding a seminar on feminist judgments and rewriting for the syllabus. And I'm asking myself, writing and rewriting legal texts, do you see any specific potential in times of crisis in this method or technique like, is it only another method based on the inside that method and experience are intertwined? Or is there a potential in terms of substantive equality, in terms of um, finding solutions from the perspectives of those most affected? And also in terms of staying open for thinking outside the box, some would maybe even say utopian thinking. So do you see a specific potential in times of crisis? And if so, what actually characterizes a good rewriting? Yeah, that's basically my question. Yeah, I think, you know, it's kind of apparent that every crisis is also an opportunity. Um, and, the reason Kim and I wrote that is because 
There's been endless fighting uh, in the women's movement for a couple decades in the U.S. about the Equal Rights Amendment, and um, I, along with some other people, decided to end that, and we did do that, um, by saying, by the way, everybody is right here. Um, it could be we only need three more states and then we'll get it, so let's get those three states. We've got them. Okay, so now I also wrote a brief that says, actually, the Equal Rights Amendment is already part of the Constitution because we did everything the Constitution says we have to do. Okay, so hey, so that's that part. But the other part was, all right, if this goes down at some point and they say, well, your three years, or your three additional states isn't adequate and actually you're way past time anyway, we think we can beat that, but say we don't, and these people rescind it, and we think we can really beat that one, but say we don't. Anyway, all this happens, and it all goes down, and we have no ERA. Kim and I thought, why don't we say what we really want? All right? So that led us to that article, uh, that you know, e equality amendment idea, which you know, we'd been talking about and, and working on for a long time and worked on it with several other people. And um, so the other thing is it came up at a time when all of the top 18, according to the rankings, but we don't care about those, uh, law reviews um, had women as editors. And at never happened before. And um, at one school... They were sitting there watching the election of all the Ed law review editors. Just happened like just now, but this was back then in that year. And my, oh my God, all 18 of them are all women. So they decided to publish a volume in which all of these 18 schools each got to pick someone to write something, anything. They wanted actually asked us to write about like our lives or something. I told them I wasn't going to do that. Okay, I was picked by Yale and Kim was picked by UCLA. So I call up Kim and I go, look, they want us to write something. Why don't we write our amendment for them? Well, we had to fight with them about whether two of us could do it together, we, on and on and on. Anyway, I'm like, you know, you can't do that. I go, oh, yes, we can. <laughs> and we will. And anyway, this, we, that's why we did it, because we had the opportunity to publish it. And everyone else wrote about their lives. And some of them were, are really worth reading. Um, but Kim didn't want to write about her life either. So um, are there our so-called careers. Um, so uh, what I mainly want to say about that piece in answer to your question is um, that as we specified in it, um, those principles and those insights are, we think, hopefully as productive for people thinking about their activism, say, uh, their own uh, commitments and direction, uh, their communities and their organizing, their, um, it, it's meant to be sort of a, a set of principles that is congealed in a constitutional form so that it's been out there for a while. If the ERA goes down, and there, we always have people in Congress we can go to and say, hey, introduce this. And then it becomes part of a larger public conversation in which, as implied also in the first question, you actually get what you need in the larger public conversation that ends up producing the legislation that then produces the constitutional fights that then produces the decision, okay? So that change process then um, you know, this would be part of, a, a part of, and it's a draft. We said so. You know, so people can take it and mark it up and think about it, crowdsource it, you know, do whatever they want to with it. But it's, you know, our contribution to that was, you know, so it isn't like, you know, ex cathedra, we're sitting here, you know, writing this thing to be, again, engraved in stone or something. You know, it isn't our, the way we imagine law writing it, our role in it, and its relation to life. Thank you. I know lots of people are trying to get in, but we'll take maybe two more questions. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Shinwa Ebert, and I wrote my PhD 
Wave at me so I can see oh, your I'm very so self. Sorry. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, so I wrote my PhD thesis with Nora Markat, and I was also dealing with um, the added value of the right to substantive equality, and I observed that this um, right is a real blind spot in many legal and judicial analysis in particular. And while you were speaking, I was thinking that it's probably also, this blind spot is probably also a manifestation of the dominance and hierarchies itself. Um, mm -hmm. and, so. <laughs> uh, so I was wondering, beyond uh, constitutional amendments mm -hmm. and talking about legal doctrine, doctrinal tools that we could sharpen, uh, what else needs to be done? What, what can we do to mobilize that right further? I, I would just say everything, anything, you know, whatever. I mean, journalism, art, media. Um, I, I don't know about social media, you know, if you want to expose yourself to that. It's also got its real downsides, but it, you know, done carefully, potentially. Um, it's been an outlet for, and, and a platform for some people and others. Uh, so, but, you know, any and all tools and that it, once you think in these terms, everything can look different to you. So how you then orient yourself, you know, within your own context is up to you. But but everything is open. It's meant to be an opening toward people's own ways of working with it. Is what it's meant to be. Thank you, though, for asking that, and thank you for having looked into it so extensively in your own work. There, you already did the an one answer to your question. You had a paper to write. You wrote it on the you know. And just one final question then behind you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Isabel Lichesky, a postdoc at the uh, University of Münster. Too. Um, I was wondering just to, to bring it back to what the courts um, can do with regard to substantive inequality, especially I think by your point in the example of children that you mentioned. So um, as, as you said very convincingly, as differentially affected by substantive inequality in a lot of senses, in a lot of areas. And you mentioned that they are... Um, uh, disadvantage in the area of, of politics and democracy because they cannot vote, but the same holds true for courts because in most countries children cannot easily access courts and litigate their own cases. The cases that you have mentioned um, in regard to climate are actually quite exceptional in that there were actual litigants who were actual children or, or young people. So I was wondering, um, and, and this doesn't just apply to, to children as a group, but also to most um, groups who are uh, differentially uh, um, affected by substantive inequality. So, what can the rule? Or how can the role of courts um, fit into this um, with regard to to access to the courts for those groups? Thank you. Well, a lot of systems are working on this and have worked on it for a long time. And you know, there there really are ways to do it. And actually, there are a lot of cases brought on behalf of children. And there's whole sets of groups that bring these cases. Uh, similarly, there's a lot of cases brought for women who themselves don't have resources uh, to pursue this, um, including by groups. And also um, many, many groups that advance the interests of people of color. That doesn't say that... All I want to do is to suggest is that you can't assume that the people who are there have some form of unique privilege. Um, they've managed to find people who will represent them and whose work this is uh, to, to do. And you know that doesn't also excuse the systemic barriers or the lack of a pro bono tradition uh, in some countries, which makes it incredibly hard. Um, but you know, in uh, at least some countries, uh, representing people without charge uh, for principled violations is you know, a built-in part of these very high-flown, uh, expensive law firms. And some of them, uh, many of them have, like all of them actually that I know of, have whole separate sections for their pro bono practice, and everyone who's interviewed is expected to say what kind of thing they might want to do, and the law firm is going to make them do this and this and this because they want them to do that, but they want to hear what kind of pro bono practice they want to help build there. 
when they come, and then they do it, you know. And you know, so uh, this needs to be and can be and should be extended. But all these cases that I mentioned, a lot of them, uh, including in systems where the representation and access is cannot be said to be adequate for disadvantaged groups at all, uh, do have. Um, groups that are bringing these cases directly on behalf uh, of the people that are most affected by it, um, just to notice. Uh, and, and I think it's one of, the, um, one of the good things about law. There's a lot of things that aren't, uh, but that it is concretely based and that real people who are the real people this is being done to are right there in front of you with you telling you these things. Um, as you intuit, seriously does matter. And, you know, there also are whole projects, I don't know how successful they've been, but like in the U.S. government called Access to the Courts. You know, part of the um, uh, DOJ, um, you know, Department of Justice. Um, and again, and, and there are uh, those entities in state governments that are, whose project is to try to figure out how to have more people have more access to the assertion of leadership, including you know, people who are unhoused, for example, and thus have no fixed address. And the first thing they want to know is, where do you live? <laughs> well, under such and so overpass, you know, where the Route 1 goes through, you know, things like that. So um, anyway, that would be all of that. I just want to say one final thing, which is, um, uh, we saw a really good example of people becoming what they're trying to fight last night. And I really, you know, that is silencing in the name of not being silenced, for example. And I just, you know, having been uh, heckled by professionals, uh, including pornographers and their friends, these folks are amateurs, but... Uh, they were the brown shirts in the room, in fact. And some of us, with a little historical knowledge, found this pretty chilling. And I really very much admired Susanna Bear's handling of it. I've never seen anybody do that successfully before. What, what she did, and Nora Markart also. So enough ab about that, and I'm glad they didn't... The deft handling of it, I, I'm glad it... Didn't, but it distract from our ability to actually have our conversation um, or hijack that conversation. But, um, you know, Gestapo tactics uh, are not limited to official power. There are other forms of it when people are unprincipled in their use of it, is my observation. And, you know, the barely disguised anti-Semitism didn't escape most of us either, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, we're going to take a brief break before handing over uh, to the next panel. Uh, just to say for those of you who weren't in attendance yesterday, there had been a prior agreement that any protesters would be allowed to speak, and that was why they were allowed to read a very long statement which many of you in the room heard. That statement has also been disseminated and contains uh, some criticisms of the state of Israel and the Israeli Supreme Court in particular. And I think in the spirit of open debate, I would recommend that you read it. And I have to say, I don't. when one reads that statement, I don't share the characteristic of the protest. And in fact, some of the protesters were very keen in their press release, which has also been circulated, to distance themselves from members of the crowd who then did become very vocal and disruptive. And I certainly share the characterization that disrupting events is not in the spirit of open debate that we want. But I think there was a substantive protest that we do want to acknowledge and that we were keen to enable. And that was part of the organizers' decision about how the event yesterday would be run. So thank you all very much. Quick break while we hand over to the next panel. So I know we needed that break. 
is a lot to talk about already, but uh, we're already kind of behind schedule and we don't want to cut all of our panels short by a lot, so I invite you to take your seats again or take different seats and sit with new people. It is my distinct pleasure to ask you to sit down one more time and then introduce the next panel to you. So, um, as you heard, we have a series of round tables. Um, so, while none of the tables here are round, except for the ones standing in the back, the idea is to have a conversation, or rather to continue the conversation that Catherine McKinnon so brilliantly kicked off this morning. And um, I think that was really rich, and we're going we're gonna to keep thinking about a lot of the concepts that she mentioned and introduced. It is now my great pleasure to introduce um, our roundtable speakers who will kick off the next uh, instance of conversations um, on persistent inequalities. The um, roundtable will be chaired by Shreya Atre. She is sitting in the middle. She's the um, Assistant Professor of International Human Rights Law um, with Bonavero Institute of Human Rights at the University of Oxford. She's a fellow and dean of Kellogg College at Oxford, and uh, her current project is called Equality Law in Times of Crisis. Couldn't be more timely. Um, on the outer part of the panel, you have Kata Regan. She is a former justice of the South African Constitutional Court from when it first uh, was founded. Previously, she worked as a lawyer in uh, housing and labor matters, among others. And she's the inaugural director of the Bonavera Institute at the University of Oxford. Um, beside her, you have Sara Ganti. She's a postdoctoral fellow at the Human Rights Center in Ghent, as well as a JSD candidate at Yale Law School. And she's currently working on merit as a proxy for how public goods and status ought to be shared. Kara Rune um, is professor of social security law and social work in Wiesbaden. And she's previously also worked as a lawyer for a trade union and uh, um, was an honorary labor law judge. So she also brings uh, a dual perspective here to the table. And um, to my immediate left, Victoria Miandazi. She's Knight Fellow in Legal and Constitutional Research at St. Andrews. And she, her recent book is called Equality in Kenya's 2010 Constitution. She's also advised the Kenyan ju um, jurist, oh, what is it? I've used an, ex an abbreviation. Uh, that judiciary, uh, that's what I wanted to write down. Judiciary uh, Committee on Elections. Thank you very much. Take it away, Shreya. Thank you. Nora, and thank you to Bashak and Catherine for organizing a fantastic gathering. Um, and it's been a pleasure hearing all the judges. Susanna, welcome back to the Academy. It couldn't be a better event to welcome you back where the rest of us have the moment to, to talk and you can sit back and listen. So I hope, I hope we don't disappoint you and you have a good time. Um, so if anyone's disappointed that you didn't get your question in, with Catherine McKinnon. We're all students of Catherine McKinnon and you'll see just how much of what she said we're going to be continuing our conversation um, on, on, on today, but especially on, on, on this panel. So, so Kitty, thank you so much for, for setting, setting us um, on the right track this morning. Really appreciate it. Um, I have the honor of chairing this panel and my mandate from the organizers is to say something short and sweet I'll fulfill the first part of my mandate. I will be brief, but the flavor profile I will be hitting will be a bit more eclectic. And the reason I say that is that I think equality law or equality lawyers are having a bit of a hard time off late. And before I explain what I mean by that, for the uninitiated, let me sketch a picture of what equality law is. So although constitutional guarantees of equality and non-discrimination have long existed for decades and even centuries in, in the case of the United States, the field of equality law is rather new. So its predecessors were labor law or employment law, and equality law really has grown as an offshoot of that, and indeed constitutional law broadly, 
but it today embodies a field of its own having its own internal and rather technical syntax and logic both in theory and in practice the speciality of equality law in contrast with other fields of law is that the causal equation of an action leading to a particular reaction which the law must address is slightly modified in by what we call technically the grounds of discrimination that is it is not only that something happens but that it happens on the basis of or on the grounds of or because of or based on grounds such as race sex sexuality religion disability etc <laughs> equality law is only triggered when the causal equation has a connection with grounds in about 50 years or so of the existence of the field give or take it appears that grounds which are the speciality of discrimination law or equality law they're proving to be more of gatekeepers rather than ushers or guides to inequality i mean this in two senses first grounds such as class poverty socio economic status which capture persisting inequalities in wealth and status both have remained marginal in equality law as sarah and cora's excellent papers on this panel will show grounds continue to pose intractable issues in activating inequality and addressing it in equality law from any egalitarian perspective grounds such as citizenship or foreignness continue to be ousted from discrimination law um and the less said about intersectionality the better a concept which courts around the world continue to struggle with they don't have so much of a problem giving it a nod of recognition but really hard and rather rather improbable to expect for them to be able to address intersectional issues especially when two or more grounds of inequalities are involved the second sense by which i mean that grounds are not serving the cause of equality law is that equality law and in particular grounds seem to be a misfit in addressing what susan marx has called root causes of inequality as kate's analysis shows equality and non discrimination in south african constitution in section 9 has not and perhaps will not be addressed so inequality through section 9 cannot be addressed through section 9 because it doesn't get to the main problem or the driver of inequality which has its root causes perhaps in apartheid geography and going further back to settler colonialism itself to a lay person this conclusion may seem startling how is it possible you may ask that equality law or equality lawyers are failing to do what it says on our badge or on the tin of equality law to address inequality after all that's that's what it is in the name equality law or discrimination law we should be addressing large scale inequalities to experts in the field this conclusion is licit it's legitimate and it's even expected and my own view is that it is expected because the very mold in which equality law is cast is a liberal one and i mean liberal in a very particular sense i don't mean in the general sense in which law and legal institutions are liberal but in a very particular sense that equality law focuses on episodic issues between individuals rather than large scale systemic problems you would be hard pressed to find any equality law whether international or comparative constitutional which refers to structural issues isms or phobias sexism racism homophobia xenophobia this is not a happenstance the choice of equality law to focus on grounds of discrimination is a choice away from addressing structures of inequality the choice though is a normative one it is a choice that has been actively made in interpreting and enforcing equality law 
rather than a choice that has been ordained in law, either in the constitutions, in the text that itself, or the legislations or the statutes. So I think we can choose differently. As I've shown in my short paper, and as Kitty mentioned this morning, the minorities in the affirmative action decisions, both in the Students for Fair Admissions in the United States last June, that decision, as well as the Indian affirmative action decision from November 2022, which is Janhit <laughs> and the U Union of India, both of those decisions, the minority showed, the, and, and several of the judges in the minority showed, that you can make a choice to address structural discrimination through equality law, or what Kate, in fact, had called in her very first judgment in the Brink case before the South African Constitutional Court in 1996, patterns of group disadvantage. That choice can be made actively. So the mold of equality law can be recast from a narrow, episodic, individualistic, exposed one to a structural one, but not without acknowledging that the two choices are fundamentally in opposition and require making a normative choice away from the liberal roots of understanding inequality and generally towards a more structural one. This choice, I think, should be rightly labeled a choice about our a priorize. For those of you who are aware of Immanuel Kant's work, for him, Kant is really interested in thinking about what are the a priorize that we work with. And I want to say that equality law today is or at least equality lawyers are, 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 are standing before a fork in the road. We should continue to work on what is internal to the field and why we call equality law a field itself. So the top five questions we ask ourselves as equality lawyers, what are grounds, which grounds, what form of equality or inequality are we talking about, direct discrimination, indirect discrimination, what kind of equality, formal or substantive, what kind of standard of proof do we want? Reasonableness, proportionality, intermediate level of scrutiny, or, or something strict? And finally, remedies, responding to negative liberty or talking about affirmative action, positive action. All of those questions, which are internal to what makes a field a field of law, should be continued to be investigated. But the other choice is to think about the a priori we are moving with and the very mold in which the field is cast, which is a liberal one, which we can, I think, move away from. But thinking about both the internal logic of the field and the nitty gritties, as well as the broader political choice of where exactly is this field coming from? What are the a priori that we have assumed? And to try to change or tinker with those would perhaps be a choice that is before us and perhaps something that we could consider today. With that, I invite the other four panelists to give their reflections on persisting inequalities, which is the title of our panel today. And I invite everyone else, whilst the panelists are talking, to think of what you have to ask. Uh, we'll try to solve all, all inequalities in the next one and a half hours for you. <laughs> Kate. Are you hearing us at the back? It might just save us time getting up and down. Um, well, thank you. Thanks, Shrey. That's a really um, great introduction. I'd like to thank the organizers, Bashak and Nora and Catherine uh, and Suzanne, for, um, for this uh, wonderful opportunity to talk. And I agree with uh, Catherine McKinnon's account that the three themes or areas we're going to talk about today are some of the most challenging, if not the most challenging for us all as a global community. Um, so I'm going to talk, my paper's called The Long Legacy of Apartheid Geography and the Limited Reach of Equality Law. So I've been wondering since I heard Catherine speak the morning, this morning where my legal imagination is lacking, and perhaps it is, and that's why we should have this conversation. I'm going to make five quick points. The first is that nobody who read the South African Constitution could come away with any impression other than it is a mission-driven constitution seeking to undo the legacy of colonialism and apartheid and put in its place a society in the language of the preamble, which is to free the potential of each person. 
In the Constitution, there's a very detailed equality clause, which Shreya has already referred to, Section 9. And it's a strong equality clause. It is an equality clause that I think was drafted with the intention of giving rise to a jurisprudence of substantive equality, uh, much in the way that Catherine mentioned this morning. It's, it's, uh, it makes it very clear that steps taken to undo uh, disadvantage caused by previous discrimination are steps in furtherance of equality. It then also has a strong uh, anti-discrimination provision with 16 grounds, which are not um, limited, maybe may be extended. It has a presumption in favor of a finding of um, discrimination in circumstances where it's shown that there's discrimination on one of those grounds. So in some ways, it reverses the ordinary appro approach to discrimination law. And the court's jurisprudence has been very active under the Equality Clause, um, probably more than 40 cases in the court's uh, 25 years, established uh, based on a, an approach that was established early on in a case called Harkson versus Lane. And if an overview of that case law would tell you that family law in particular has been an area where the Equality Clause has been extraordinarily influential in law, if not in... <coughs> the lived experience of people's lives. South Africa has a pluralist system of family law with a system of civil law, African customary law, systems of personal, uh, Muslim personal law, Jewish law, Hindu law. All of these kinds of uh, forms of family life um, are, are, were not recognized but exist as lived experience. And of course, there are same-sex relationships, heterosexual relationships, non-traditional forms of marriage. And what the jurisprudence has done has basically said that the pr protections that exist in legislation uh, to s partners in those marriages must be conferred upon all of these different forms of, of family. Uh, African family, families according to African customary law, uh, same-sex relationships, heterosexual relationships who haven't entered into marriages. And this has been an, you know, an enormously influential uh, jurisprudence. It's a much more interesting question and one which I'd like to see a lot more research done on as to what has happened to people's lives as a result of this jurisprudence. But if you read the actual case law, there's no doubt that, for example, things like <laughs> maintenance for surviving spouses, uh, the right to inherit, a uh, whole range of treat treating partners equally, all of these principles are espoused in law. There's also been quite a strong jurisprudence in another area that is uh, Susanna, one of Susanna's um, uh, great specialties, which is social security, both in relation, interestingly, to non-citizens, um, but also to domestic workers, a case that um, Shreya mentioned in her paper. Uh, and there's been a reasonably strong affirmative action jurisprudence as well. And yet, my third point, if you look at inequality in South Africa, it is persistent. We, didn't, we don't have really much of a baseline to look at. The apartheid government never measured inequality. The first measures of inequality and poverty in South Africa were done in 1993. And at that stage, it was clear that uh, on a, on a, depending on how you set the poverty line, if you set it a little bit higher, half of all South Africans were living in poverty. And that was a racialized category with only about 2% of white South Africans living in poverty. But if you look at today's figures, there's relatively little difference. There is still deep patterns of inequality in South Africa. The only sort of significant change which is perhaps worth commenting on is that if you look at the top decile, the wealthiest decile in South Africa, that is no longer so racially unequal. 70% of that decile are now people of color. But if you go down to the bottom decile or the bottom four deciles, nearly all of those are people of color. So there has been um, the same pattern overall, and a Gini coefficient, a, a measure of inequality, the same pattern, but there has been at the top end a slight re uh, reduction in racial inequality, but not at the bottom end at all. My fourth point is that if you look at the pattern of apartheid and colonial geography, which is deeply inscribed in South African life, the patterns of inequality run along that. We, we overlook, I think, space in inequality. And that's odd, because one of our very earliest phrases talking about inequality and equality was talking about similarly situated people. In my paper, for those of you who've had a chance to see it, you'll see a graph which maps 
unemployment in South Africa across those areas of South Africa that were reserved for black people only under colonialism and under apartheid. And in, the er in those areas, unemployment now sits at about 80%. In other parts of South Africa, the, the average rate of unemployment is just under 40%. There's, we can have a big debate about numbers, economists do, but I'm just gonna give you the sort of headline numbers. So what that's telling us is that nearly 30 years after the end of apartheid, patterns of inequality remain deeply spatially seated. And the jurisprudence of the court, I think, has not reached into this at all. And my fifth point is to say a little bit about why I think that is, and to take one example um, from, a, from another area of, of, um, the, of the area that I've been involved in, which, which perhaps illustrates this. One of the reasons it was easy to get at family law is that they were legal rules. They were, in fact, generally not directly discriminatory legal rules. They were indirect discriminatory legal rules. But they were, nevertheless, it was pretty clear that if Muslim women were not protected by the Marriage Act, that was going to impact on them indirectly. So it was, it was relatively easy for courts to, and for litigants to say, I want to be treated like other women in these situations. The problem with this pattern, pattern um, issues of inequality is that it, they're not stipulated in the law. Uh, in fact, Catherine finished off by talking about how, um, you know, since Brown versus Board of Education, it's not lawful to have segregation in schools in the United States, but here we are, 75 years later, and you still have them. And that's really what's happening. So that means that actually this is a fact-based pattern. Now, the case I want to refer to, or the issue I want to refer to, was um, in 2014, a colleague, uh, um, Vusi Pakoli and I, were appointed to investigate policing in one of Cape Town's poorest neighborhoods, Kailicha, which is on the eastern boundary of Cape Town. Um, about half a million people live in Kailicha. And... They are very, very poor people. Um, many of them recently urbanized, 75% um, of them below the poverty line. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very poor neighborhood. Uh, very few people are employed in the neighborhood as well. What nobody had really realized, I think, until we subpoenaed information from the police was that this is a drastically under-policed community. It is also the community that, if you take it as a whole, has highest rates of rape, sexual violence, murder, um, robbery, aggravated robbery, every form of violent crime that you want to name. It has the highest rates, or one of the highest rates in South Africa. And what we found when we got the information, finally, are having had to... the the process having had to go to the Constitutional Court to require the police to co cooperate with the request, was that actually, and I think this surprised the police uh, as much as it horrified us, was that the allocation of police to this neighborhood was way out of line with either the pop per capita population or um, the crime rates, which you would have thought were like the two basic ways you might start thinking about police resource allocation. And there was really no explanation for this bar a very weak form of resource allocation being used by the police. The most depressing thing about this is that if my sort of almost two years spent doing that commission of inquiry made me realize more than anything else that security of the person is one of the most fundamental rights. It matters to women, but it matters to everybody. Children going to school were subjected to robberies. It was really quite extraordinary to see a community and the effect on a community of deep absence of security of the person. And yet, here we had a situation where we have a post-apartheid government who I think, you know, on their good days are really trying to make a difference, effectively persisting with devastatingly under-policing a neighborhood, which is devastatingly lacking in security of the person. Now, those findings were made in 2014, and the NGO civil society organizations who had militated for the establishment of the Commission of Inquiry have been, in the 10 years since, militating to try and get police resourcing allocation fixed. Sarah refers to the case in her paper, uh, and I can just tell you that that's not been successful, and it's not successful as we speak today. Now, the interesting question is why that would be. Um, I'm not gonna hesitate, uh, I'm not gonna proffer any answers. But it does, I think, illustrate why law and uh, equality jurisprudence really struggle 
to make a difference to deeply spatial patterns of inequality. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shreya. Thank you all. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you, Katrin. Thank you, Noha, and thank you, Bashak. It's, it's an honor. Daphne Barakeres yesterday mentioned that uh, the importance of, wor of, of words uh, for the legal field, that um, the legal field and, and law is a discipline of words. And in the same way, I would like today, in my very brief remark, speak about narratives and law. My paper is entitled Poverty in Judge Craft, New Narratives Through the Language of Discrimination Law. Myth about poverty perpetuates socioeconomic exclusion, and the law preserves this myth. This myth about poverty, empty, real, uh, empty reality, and evacuate history. I argue that we need new narratives about poverty in law. And I argue that discrimination, equality law, is actually an appropriate language to develop these new narratives. And judges could be the main narrators of these new narratives, even meta-narrators, because in the end, they tell stories about stories. There are four myths which need four new narratives. The first myth is what poverty is about. Usually, we read, we are told, that poverty is about deprivation of basic material need. The World Bank tells us that extreme poverty threshold is $2.50 a day. This vision of poverty ignores the relationship between poverty and inequality. In the end, the biggest the equalities are, the more difficult for people in poverty is to adapt to the society they are living in. This definition of poverty also defines the need of people in poverty. They deprive them of any agency to define themselves, they all need. So we need new narrative. We need a new narrative about what poverty is to describe the multidimensional and complex phenomenon of poverty. It encompasses deprivation, of course, deprivation uh, which goes much beyond shelter and food, education, housing, um, uh, work. There is also this very important dimension, which is, which is the relational dimension of poverty. Poverty is about how the society, how people treat people in poverty, how institutions treat people in poverty. It's also about the core experience, how people in poverty feel poverty in their body, in their mind. This feeling of powerlessness, it also relates to agency. And so here, what I explain in my paper is that the language of substantive equality um, that uh, Catherine McKinnon this morning powerfully um, uh, unpacked for us, like this language of substantive um, equality is quite appropriate to tell this new story about what poverty is in the legal field. The second, new, the second narrative I'm arguing for is actually a term that I borrow from Catherine Mackinnon, what she called the what happened narrative. This what happened narrative needs to replace the amnesic approach about past and present exploitation and oppression regarding poverty. And I think that's what Kate uh, has just explained about the failure of equality law and discrimination law in, in Africa, which in South Africa, which did not take into account the, the legacy of spatial apartheid is, is extremely powerful. The third narrative I'm arguing for is the narrative that I call structural disadvantage. In many instances, when you read decisions by courts, poor people or poverty is depicted as uh, something which is, in the, uh, it, which is related to an individual in particular and with a strong question of responsabilization uh, behind it. What Carol Bridges called the moralization of poverty. Poor people are poor because there is something wrong with them. 
we need to change the narrative as well, and especially in, 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 in court's decision and in the law, to adopt a new narrative regarding the structural and systemic character of the phenomenon of poverty. Poverty is passed from one generation to the next. And the last narrative, the last narrative I'm arguing for, it's a narrative uh, of participation. The law tells us that people in poverty are criminal or at best deviant. Vagrants, rough sleepers, beggars, people who commit misdemeanors related to life-sustaining activities, people who do not abide by the law and by the conditions they are imposed in order to get their, socials, uh, their welfare benefits, all these people are punished. It excludes them, of course, from the society. It also prevents them to access their rights. What is the basis of that? They are just different. They are just different. They tr struggle to adapt to the society. And this is just a way to manage social insecurity. And this myth about poverty regarding the fact that they are criminal or they are deviants precludes the democratic project that people should be able to relate to each other as equal. So as long as this myth about poverty prevail in the legal field, I think that any serious attempt to tackle social exclusion through law will fail. And so I really think that we need to develop new narratives in the legal field regarding poverty. And I hope that this opened the discussion about it. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me to this wonderful event to today and for getting the chance to listen to Catherine McKinnon um, that I've read a lot during my, um, when, I read, uh, when I wrote my PhD. So great honor to be here. I'm interested in gender discrimination, but also in economic inequality and constitutional law. And regarding persistent inequalities, I want to focus today on how we can address poverty and socioeconomic discrimination under German constitutional law. This becomes more important in times of right-wing and neoliberal exclusionary social policies that are fueled by the multiple crises that we face today and that are justified by hierarchizing and devaluing stereotypes about the most vulnerable social groups, especially poor people, the working poor, refugees, and migrants with precarious residence status. I want to suggest that we transfer the insights that we have from gender discrimination cases to social constitutional law, thus to cases that deal with social welfare benefits. I argue that also in social constitutional law, we need a relational approach that looks at the structuring of power relations and does not individualize poverty and a low socioeconomic status. In the German context, such an approach has already been established in a substantive interpretation of gender equality. Regarding the discrimination of women, the Federal Constitutional Court of Germany discusses in detail the social conditions and structural reasons for gender inequality, the social situations of women, by taking into account empirical data, social science research, and the history of gender inequality in Germany. The court addresses the hegemonic masculine norms inscribed in legal provisions and the unequal effects of supposedly neutral regulations on men and women, thereby making the perspective of the others visible. This contextual approach has contributed to a stereotype-sensitive standard of review that focuses on hierarchizing and exclusionary effects of cultural value schemata. My argument is that we could transfer such a relational substantive equality approach to cases of socioeconomic inequality and discrimination on grounds of socioeconomic status. Of course, in a democracy, it is a task of the legislator 
to decide how to distribute the state resources and how social welfare benefits are designed. In social law, Apex courts and also the Federal Constitutional Court of Germany therefore refer to judicial restraint. Nevertheless, in times of neoliberal policies and right-wing narratives that seek to lower social security standards, especially for the most vulnerable social groups, the Federal Constitutional Court has the role of ensuring that social assistance is high enough to lead a life in accordance with human dignity and to be socially included. And also that foreign nationals are not arbitrarily excluded from social welfare benefits merely based on anti-migration narratives. That is why I think it is important to strengthen practices of social constitutionalism, especially with a substantive interpretation of human dignity and the principle of equality, and also a notion of social class in the context of capitalism. And in doing so, introducing an anti-discrimination anti perspective into social constitutional law. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. So um, again, I'm uh, Victoria Miandazi, and I'd like to give a background of my paper. So having been in academia, uh, I was previously in practice, uh, worked as a legal researcher for the judiciary, and then I was deeply worried about inequality. Um, and then so go, went on to do you know, a PhD under Professor Sandra Fedman, and I was so interested by her four-dimensional approach to substantive equality. So uh, what is that? So looking at recognition, redistribution, transformation, and participation. And that really informed uh, part of my, my approach to looking at substantive equality in the Kenyan constitution. So at that time as well, um, you know, Kenya had already passed a new constitution, the 2010 constitution, and it has far reaching provisions on equality. So particularly article uh, 27, uh, that's the main equality clause, talks about not just formal equality, but substantive equality. So uh, it says, you know, it provides for everyone should be treated the same um, before the law. Um, and then it goes on to talk about uh, equality in the, in the sense that, you know, women should, there should be uh, inclusion of we, both men and women in all fields of life. It also goes on to talk about affirmative action, and it says that there should be affirmative action uh, to, to, get, uh, to resolve past disadvantage. And uh, applying affirmative action, it provides for this unique principle that talks about the genuine need that it should apply to those who are genuinely in need. And not just that, it goes ahead to talk about, uh, because of gender inequality, uh, a lot of gender inequality issues in Kenya, that there should be not more than two thirds of any gender uh, in elective and appointive positions. And it goes ahead even in Article 232 to, talks about, to talk about appointments, uh, all types of appointments, that there should be inclusivity. So it's not just about merit, but there should be inclusivity of the diversity of the Kenyan people. Uh, so not just uh, about, it's, uh, it's about gender, it's about inclusion of disability, persons with disabilities, regional inclusivity, because in Kenya, there's a problem with uh, that has always been, uh, because of colonialism, a problem with ethnic, divisive ethnic politics. So past governments <laughs> used to, um, you know, divide people or give resources according to the ethnic groups that provided them the most support. So there is, there are lots of provisions on equality. So being armed with, you know, the, the good provisions uh, of the law, and also armed with the, the great education and uh, the advisement of such a great equality scholar, I said, okay, let me go back to practice. But then that is the point of my paper because there's a problem with an, how do you enforce the law? How do you make equality a reality to the people? So the context that, uh, you know, uh, Kate has spoken about in relation to South Africa, that's the same context we find in Kenya because we find a lot of poverty, a lot of inequality. Um, you know, post-COVID, you know, poverty increased from affecting 31.6% of the population to 41.5% uh, 
41.9% uh, of the population. And there's, there had been, you know, progressively, uh, you know, good trends towards uh, getting, reducing inequal uh, inequality and poverty. And then uh, as well, uh, the constitution is really great because it provides for socioeconomic rights. Uh, and, uh, you know, practicing in the courts, you know, and, and writing also about landmark cases, being part of landmark cases, like uh, one called Me to Bell Society, Welfare Society, about uh, informal settlers having the right uh, that lived in, uh, in this area called, you know, it was a um, Mitumba village, an informal settlement that lived there for more than 70 years. And the Supreme Court ga gave such a great decision in 2022 that, you know, they have a right because the preamble of the Constitution says everyone has a right, the land belongs to the people of Kenya. So there could be, they had a right to that public land in which they had uh, settled. But then, you know, I had written a lot about that, how, you know, very great reviews about that. But then, um, you know, some, uh, one of the uh, people who live there wrote for me an email, uh, a message on Twitter saying, okay, it's been, you know, uh, it was in last, last year, uh, at, the end of la at the end of last year. Um, he said, okay, we haven't really, the, the judgment was really good, but we still haven't gotten our rights. So what prompted my paper, which talks about balance of deference to state, uh, and in terms of, I look at uh, the housing levy and, you know, the courts as the guardians of the constitution, what they need to do in, in order to make equality a reality and avoid reinforcing inequality is, uh, for me, I talk about, it's not just soft form judicial review, but, you know, court could also be activists, could also go the extra mile. And the constitution allows for it by talking about, you know, mm, not just giving it, saying, okay, yes, um, article 29, uh, tw 22, uh, C talks about, you know, there should be deference. Like if the state has made a decision on resource allocation and it's sound that the state, the, 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 the courts should not interfere on the basis that it could have reached a different conclusion. But even in, uh, you know, it goes on to state that the government has a responsibility to give evidence on what it has been doing, right? And not just that, but it, uh, the concern itself gives the um, high court, there's a constitutional division of the high court, mm -hmm. the power to review every law on its just, uh, uh, you know, whether it aligns with the provisions of the constitution and hence the housing levy. And just to add, there's a big problem of access to justice and the case of the housing levy, which is a recent one, uh, basically, what was it all about? It was about the addition of 3% um, housing levy to everybody in informal settlement, uh, sorry, in informal, uh, informal employment, sorry, in order to take care of national housing crisis. So the, the challenge was that, you know, it only takes 3%, uh, contributed half by the empl uh, employ employer, half by the employee, uh, only for those in formal employment. And just some statistics, um, you know, more than half of you know um, people in employment in Kenya are in informal employment, so that brings in a problem. So if if it's a housing, uh, yes, there's a right to housing under Article 43, and the government is uh, you know sorting that out. Why is only you know the those informal employment? Why are they only the ones to share the burden of taxation? So the case went to court, and I have to say there's also an issue about access to justice in this case because Okia Omtata is an activist and a self-represented litigant. And he has brought so many, uh, you know, public interest cases in the court. And that's also something to acknowledge because, you know, there was a public outcry because there, was, there wasn't just that increase in tax, but also the increase in income tax by 5%, increase in value added ta tax from 8% uh, to 16%. So there were demonstrations that people, there was a public outcry. And so that's why the case was very landmark but then I talk about, you know, that, that being one example. And on structural interdicts, it's mainly about the Me Too Bell case because the, the government didn't go ahead to enforce the judgment as the court said it should. So I talk about structural interdicts and when they should happen because it's all about, okay, yes, it's, it's, you know, it can be all rosy, it can be very flowery and, and progressive, but it doesn't mean anything to people if it's not implemented. And hence why I talk about, you know, reinf not reinforcing inequality and addressing inequality also needs various tools and 
you know, uh, judges to be innovative in various ways to ensure provision of the, and realizing of this equality rights for the people. Um, so in short, that's all about my paper. Thank you. Thanks, Vicky, and thanks to all. This is working, excellent. I think it might be a good point to open it up to the audience here. Um, and just two things to say. Um, please keep your questions brief. Um, and if you can identify yourself, that'd be excellent. We'll take three questions or comments at a time and then come back to the panel. If you would want to identify someone on the panel who should answer your question, please do that. Otherwise, we'll leave it up to the panelists to choose what they would like to respond to. Um, Please introduce yourselves and keep it brief. We'll take three at a time. I see a hand up there, white shirt, Mihela, and then there was another hand right there, the blue sweater. Excellent. We'll take th those three first. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, hi, my name is Mariana Velasco Rivera uh, from Maynooth University. Uh, my question is, is just a clarification question for Vicky. So uh, about the case, uh, the housing uh, levy case, um, who were the beneficiaries of that act? Because if the tax was, you know, for for only per, like people in the formal in the formal market, uh, but the beneficiaries were also people, you know, like they were like people in the informal in the informal economy were going to be beneficiaries of housing. Uh, I see that one could make an argument that, you know, like this actually maybe I don't know, like. Um, sort of like trying to to address root um, you know causes of, of inequality and sort of like you know um, yeah in a way like sort of like um, make a, a, a make um, a, or address a, a, a root um, a, a deeply rooted inequality. So I just wanted to um, a, to ask you that because in your paper it seems that um, the argument of inequality is. Um, addressing those who were obliged obliged to pay the, the, the levy. So how would you deal with that? Like, I don't know if, I mean, maybe it's just like not applicable. But that's Thank it. you. Thanks. Um, hi, uh, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Juan Aus, uh, Tilburg University. My question is for uh, Kate Reagan. Um, you mentioned that you found this uh, patterns of uh, resource allocation for police in precarious neighborhoods in South Africa, in Cape Town. And that reminded me of another conversation that is happening in, you know, in the global north, in the US specifically, about defunding the police. Uh, and I was wondering if you know, this parallel conversation can actually interact, because basically what I say in the US is that the problem is that resource allocation exactly, but because you know, they're putting a lot of money and resources to police, but not in the structural causes of inequality and, and racism. Uh, so I, I was wondering if you can see, you know, this parallelism, how this conversation can actually interact in the context of South Africa, and maybe resource allocation can actually have this other tone. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Michaela. Thanks, um, Michaela Heilbronner, also University of Münster, um, proudly <laughs> representing. Anyway, thanks a lot for these um, very interesting presentations. Um, I entirely share the uh, concern with implementation and structural remedies that was also mentioned before already. I have a slightly self-interested two-part question, but it's a real question as opposed to just a comment. So my two-part question is, um, do you see any potential for an overlap between procedural approaches to rights adjudication and the concern with structural remedies and sort of institutional reform? I'm asking that because that's sort of an angle I'm interested in. My sense is that probably most of the progressive people represented here in this room are very critical towards procedural approaches. And I understand why to some degree, but I do wonder if there can't be a sort of beneficial potential in using them towards driving sort of certain institutional structures, which is what we actually need in order to realize certain outcomes on the ground. And the second one is that that precise approach has often been criticized. Well, I'm not sure about often, but at least in the German context, it's been criticized as a sort of inappropriate administrative law approach to the matter, treating parliament essentially like an administrator where we have to guide them step through steps, showing them exactly what to do. And I'm, I've been grappling with that. Um, I'm, and I'm not sure I share that concern, but I'd be interested in your reaction. Thanks. 
I smell a Vicky, then Kate, and then anyone on the panel can take the final question. Thank you, Mariana, for the question. Um, and so in the housing levy case, the beneficiaries were everybody, um, all persons in the population, and particularly those who are most vulnerable, right? Um, so everybody was to bear the tax burden. Um, so the, the problem was that, um, and as was highlighted in the case, for, formal, uh, for persons in formal employment, their employers under Article 30 of the Employment Act had a responsibility to provide them with housing or to make steps towards you know, permanent housing. Um, and, I can, and I can talk about that because I'm a permanent employee of a government university. I'm currently on leave of absence in Kenya. And part of, my, uh, part of the pension scheme uh, and the initiative is to come up with housing. So at the end, uh, I am expected to, have, to be uh, you know, eligible for housing because of, you know, through my pension scheme. So most of the formal employers uh, kind of, ha parts of their salaries are or go into housing for themselves. So um, that was part of uh, one of the, you know, types of arguments that were being made. So if uh, it's for everybody, why is it, and it's, the problem is that also there's the taxation uh, laws, uh, there's a gap in relation to taxing the informal sector so actually, it's, you make more money as a taxi driver than you would make in a you know like basic uh, office job for informal employment. So there, there were deep concerns about inequality and particularly the problems in the tax system. And uh, then you know go, going ahead and saying, oh, what's the easy way out? Let's just do what's easier to tax formal employers employees. Um, so I hope that makes sense. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so an interesting question and about what the relationship would be between the um, policing in Kailicha and questions around reform the police, particularly in the US. And it shows you how context is all, because in many ways what was happening in Kailicha, the Commission of Inquiry was a project of a group of civil society organizations based in Kailicha who were basically saying, we want policing. What we have at the moment is no policing. If we go to a police station... We very often are, you know, the complaint isn't heard. There's certainly no follow-up. The levels of prosecution for murder are miserably low, and, and the successful prosecutions miserably low, and the same for all violent crimes, rape, all forms of sexual abuse. Just And, and people say, we want the police. So it, it, it's, a, it's an interesting sort of a contrast. Um, and and what, what I think the commission found was it's not surprising people want the police because actually they have hardly any. Um, and, and then there is obviously questions around policing culture and all of that, and that's been, a, you know, we can take this one-on-one. -on -one. There's been a huge um, ongoing contestation about that in the immediate aftermath of um, apartheid. For example, we used to refer to police as the police force, um, which is, I think, a very old-fashioned way of doing it, but it was not an inaccurate way of describing it. They were a very violent force, and they were a force effectively to enforce apartheid law. And then we changed it to the South African Police Service, and it was, the idea was to create a community policing. And, um, and you know, then there was a pushback against that. Um, so it's, 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 it, there's a huge fight around policing culture. But what was interesting sitting in that room in Kailicha um, for weeks and weeks and weeks hearing um, evidence with many members of the community there and many members of the police. The police are drawn from the community. Uh, in South Africa, this is, well, at least in Kailicha, you know, the, many, many of the police are people themselves from poor black communities. And conversations happened. And I, you could see that there was a sort of beginning to understand each other's problems. Um, but uh, unfortunately, you know, we didn't get any support really from national level government or, or below. So there's still really not enough policing in Kailicha. People still live with real problems of violence. And another way of thinking about it was just wanting the rule of law, wanting security of the person. So we haven't got sort of beyond that. And it's not to say that there aren't times of police abuse. This was happening more or less at the same time as Marikana, where police opened fire on, pro on protesting um, mine, mine workers and, sh and shot them, the worst incident of police violence uh, in, in South African democratic history. So, you know, it's, it is very complicated. 
the interesting little point about Marikana, which is worth knowing, is that there were a lot of police there that day. The only unit that did not open fire were the people who were trained in firearms use in public policing situations. Everybody else was probably just terrified. Um, and so it's a, it's a complex set of questions, and I don't think they're very easy answers. And Michaela's question, I'm very sympathetic, Michaela, as you probably know, to, to this connection. And uh, so this is the idea that, and it comes back to Bashak's question in the first, in the first um, panel in, in relation to Catherine's presentation, which was, what are the remedies? And when you're dealing with wicked, intractable legal problems, if we knew the remedies, we could go on the streets and we could demand government implement them. Just sort this out. This was what needs doing. But actually, I mean, the kind of problems we're facing in South Africa, and I think the problems that are being faced in many parts of the world on these three areas we're talking about, um, are not easy. We don't know what the answers are. And for that reason, I think courts are po very poorly placed to make affirmative, clear remedial demands. Because basically what we need is trial and error. We need to see, well, this works and that doesn't. And courts are not very suited to de dealing with that sort of thing. And so the idea, I still believe, of holding government to say, you've got to do something. Whatever you do has got to be reasonable and plausible, and we've got to think that it's likely to solve the problem. You've got to monitor it, and litigants can come back and tell us it's not solving the problem. So in, a, in a, perhaps the slightly... Um, one of my colleagues on the court used to say, holding a government's feet to the fire. The idea that actually you'd hold government to their duty to do something, but not tell them what exactly it was, not because we're trying to be Sybil-like or um, mysterious, because frankly, we're not sure, and it would be much better for government to keep trying. That's the intersection between procedural approaches and structural remedies that I think you're exploring. I don't think it's at all insulting to call that an administrative law approach. I, I completely support the administrative law approach. I think when government is meant to govern, they are the experts at government, requiring them to act lawfully, reasonably, openly, all the principles of administrative law, that's a legitimate claim. But for courts to try and do it themselves, I think, I mean, well, certainly, if I were to be asked what to do, I'd have no idea. And the, I mean, maybe uh, some of my colleagues would have better ideas, I don't know, but I, I think this is a job of government. And it's not inappropriate. The administrative law approach, I think, is properly calibrated, not only for democracy, but also for institutional capacity. Any third question, anyone? Maybe in addition to what Kate just said, I think this um, approach is really interesting for compensating the inequalities with access to justice. And this is what Vicky wrote about in her paper, how uh, procedural instruments can make sure that also powerless people can have a follow-up and uh, at the court and that not only the powerful can um, claim their fundamental rights in front of the uh, apex courts. Um, and because we have these structural inequalities uh, regarding access to justice, I think this is worth exploring more. This is why I found, found your um, paper really interesting. And with regard to the parliament, what I found really inspiring um, when I read the ruling on social assistance law for asylum seekers uh, of 22 is that the court required um, the parliament to not just use mere assumptions, that you have to base legislation on empirical facts and an empirical account of social reality. And I think this is also a very important constitutional limit, uh, especially uh, in social law. Just a, a man, minor point about the procedural right approach versus structural reforms. I think they are very complementary, in fact. And I'm thinking of this huge issue, especially in, in the OECD countries of non-take-up, where basically like people in poverty can just don't have the, the possibility to claim their rights because of very 
practical barriers, which are also procedural. So I think that here administrative law has a very important role to, to play as well. So to me, like the two approaches are actually very complementary. And so I wouldn't oppose them in a sense, and especially when it comes to tackling poverty. Thanks. I'm also going to add something about the procedural versus substantive dimension, and, and I'm going to do it very specifically in relation to what the European Court of Human Rights is doing in terms of developing um, what they call the procedural violation of, of the article. And I, th I don't have a problem with it, but I do have a big problem with the selective application of it. So every time the court has presented evidence of, say, discrimination in a sex discrimination case, the court is quite open to finding a substantive violation. For every case of racial discrimination, the court has been steadfast in finding a procedural violation. And I think the difference between the two, to me, is not apparent. Why is the court doing that? And I'm going back to Judge Bonello's blazing dissent in the Anilova case where he said, look through the annals of the court history and you won't find a single violation until then. Um, and, and, and that was the first time that the, he came out saying, and then after that, the court, the court changed course. He's like, you won't find a single violation of Article 14 um, and a single finding on racial discrimination. He changed the course of history, but we've only gotten so far that we seem to be getting procedural violations now. And I think there's a hierarchy of grounds now set in the European Court of Human Rights, which isn't exactly the same as what's happened in the United States with respect to a tiered scrutiny of different issues. But I think we've reached our own hierarchy from a very different route. And I think the hierarchy is ra rather untenable because it's not what is apparent in the text of Article 14. Another round of questions, and then perhaps we'll come back. Uh, keep them brief, but we'll take three at a time. I see Stefan's hand is up. There's, if you can catch my eye, that'd be great. Catherine. Hi. Fantastic. Hi, uh, Stefan Salomon from the University of Amsterdam. My question goes to Kate. Uh, so you basically spoke about inequalities and the spatial patterns of inequalities in South Africa. I would want to zoom out and um, ask about, so the highest economists point out that the highest inequalities are actually between countries. Legal structures uphold these inequalities. Citizenship, residence requirements, visa requirements. So I was wondering whether you could speak about the role of South African courts in dealing with rights requested by non-citizens in South Africa, given that South Africa is one of the major destination countries. And to link it also to uh, yesterday's sessions, this is also very much, goes very much to the core of democracy, in particular about the boundaries of democracy, who belongs and who does not, and who does not belong. These boundaries should also be, and um, democratic scholars have pointed out that these boundaries are also up to the de de uh, democratic deliberation. So I was wondering also about if you have time to address the second issue and how South African courts actually deal with this dilemma. Thanks, Stefan. Catherine? Uh, thank you. It, it actually follows on a little, um, and it's partly about grounds, um, and just very uh, concretely about when nationality discrimination is also race discrimination, because it's something that I know several of you have addressed. And shout out to the Kenyan courts who have very clearly in particular context said, you know, treating Somali refugees in this way is race discrimination. And that's the end of the analysis. The International Court of Justice says race and nationality rarely overlap. Sarah, in your work in particular with uh, Kochanov, you know, you take a very different view. And Shreya, you've gone for a very distinctive approach, I think, if I've read your article on xenophobic discrimination correctly. So just anybody who wanted to pick that up. Um, and I'm also very interested, our former colleague Arjun Apurderai wrote a fabulous piece about <clears throat> how race and caste are beasts of social reproduction, which I thought I always want to keep that phrase, particularly as we're discussing about law and social change, like why are some inequalities so resistant? And I, I think maybe just thinking about nationality as one of those you know, very firmly legally entrenched source of inequality would be very interesting as well. Thanks, Catherine. Daniela? Thank you. First of all, I want to congratulate whoever organized this panel of brilliant all-woman panel. I really, really uh, enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> exactly. Um, 
I was, I was listening to all of you and a lot of what I heard was the courts can do this, the courts have to do this, it's up to the courts, the courts have the power. And of course, I'm a, very sen a little sensitive to the topic, but I feel like those are expectations that are very difficult to manage by a court. It's, uh, it's sometimes a little, you know, it, it's easier to say the courts can do this, they have the power, it's in the law, it's in the constitution, than to really realize the legitimacy of courts to order certain certain measures, and that's what I was thinking while I was listening to you. And so, I uh, wanted to see, see if maybe Kate, with her experience in you know poverty and uh, um, inequality, but also her experience as a former judge, would would comment on on what you heard here about the role of the court. I guess you already did. You said when you said, you know, uh, the court should say to the government, you have to do something, but the court shouldn't say this is what you have to do. If you could elaborate a little bit on that, on how how far should the courts go on reparations, you know, ordering public policies to be adopted or at least designing part of the public policy or just overseeing that something gets done. Um, I would love to hear uh, some of your ideas with that because I am. I think we should also talk about the dangers of courts going too far when it comes to ordering reparations uh, or public policies. Thank you. It's more of a follow-up because as I heard uh, Daniela uh, speaking, I felt as though I'm speaking, you know, in the sense that uh, uh, this uh, this comment is very much uh, connected to the issue of the pressures on the court. And I, I will just add here maybe a small paradox. Obviously, I mean, equality is should be the main mission, of course, because uh, courts can speak for those who are relatively excluded from the political process. Mm -hmm. But but here's the paradox. The more a, a certain group is excluded from the process, the more difficult it is for the court in terms of legit public legitimacy to protect. This is this does not mean that the court will not protect. It just, mean, but it just points to the fact that there is a, a paradox here, and just to make it uh, maybe more uh, concrete, I'll just give an example that I think that nowadays it's relatively easier for courts to protect women, for example, who are not completely included in the, in the process uh, substantively, but are relatively more included, much more difficult than to protect asylum seekers, for example, although it may be even more important to give rights to those who are completely excluded. So from the judicial perspective, I just wanted to follow up on Daniela. Thank you. Thank you so much. Who wants to kick us off, Kate? Might you start with you and go in the other direction? Uh, so to your question at the back, I, I do agree that the issues of migrancy are, are crucial and there is a patchiness, I would say, about um, the approach by courts in South Africa to this. In the early years, there were some strong decisions. Um, perhaps the most obvious one is a case called Koso and Machlule, which concerned, and I mentioned it earlier, the rights of people who are permanent residents, migrants, in fact, from Mozambique, to get access to social security grants. Um, and the court uh, is a right to social security, one of the economic and social rights in the constitution, and the court held the, the exclusion of this community who had been permanent residencies granted by the state. And, people, and, and they were really a community that had fled Mozambique as a result of the apartheid state's reprisals against Mozambique during the apartheid period. So, you know, there's a whole history here and the court held that they should be granted social security. And in fact, that all permanent residents, there was no reason to exclude permanent residents from social security if they were, met the means test, i.e. if they were poor, they should be able to get social security. Um, and then there was um, uh, two cases, which I, one of which I dissented in, but another one which has just recently been dis decided, which actually Shreya mentions in her paper called Rafaneke, which is the Rafaneke is about the rights of um, South African trained Zimbabwean lawyers to be admitted to the legal profession. And um, 
they are by definition all legally in South Africa. So the only bar to their being admitted to the profession is that they have not yet got citizenship. And the court said that this was a legitimate uh, limitation on, on, on the rights of, of, of you know, the, not on, didn't constitute unfair discrimination. I think there was an enormous amount of disappointment with that decision. Um, I suppose one would say that the legal profession is in many places one of the oldest forms of the closed shop, so perhaps one shouldn't be too surprised generally by that kind of ruling, but it, 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 it really isn't uh, the sort of ruling one would hope to see coming out of the court. Um, on the question about, uh, Catherine's question about nationality and race discrimination, that's not really a question that's pertinently come before the court. I can't remember in Rafaneke, I'd have to go back and have a look to see if this was formulated as race discrimination. I think it was formulated entirely on nationality and citizenship terms. Shreya, yeah, okay. So that's very interesting. Um, and of course, all of these Zimbabweans are black African people from Zimbabwe. Um, so I can't uh, add anything much there. And then to your question about high expectations, I mean, on the one hand, yes. I, 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 um, I think it was you last night who talked about sometimes our friends can expect too much of us. No, it was the judge from the um, uh, European Court of Human Rights. And I, I think that's, that's right. People make a lot of demands on the court. But, you know, I do feel that, that people should have access to the court and they should be able to make the demands that they think are appropriate. And it's for courts who are effectively powerful, well-paid, to get the law right, even if it makes one a bit unpopular, which <laughs> it does from time to time. Um, so I, I think this is a burden courts should just broaden their shoulders and, and, and bear. Um, but it does mean that it's not a popularity contest, as again somebody else said. It's about trying to get the law right. And sometimes one's own sense of, you know, you want to give relief because you can see the circumstances in which people are, but you do realize um, that, that you can't always do that um, without getting the law in some really fundamental way wrong. And that that's a difficult thing because as judges, we want justice to be what we do, but we also have a duty to law. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Catherine, for, um, for the question about nationality and race. Um, I have a kind of a kind of a strong opinion about it. I, I really think that nationality or citizenship is um, actually um, a, a way to to mask racial inequalities, a racial uh, discrimination. There is a very a big hypocrisy about it. Um, so the biggest inequalities in the world, and this is uh, Branko Milanovic, uh, which which is explaining that, like uh, happens nowadays along uh, the borders and uh, along uh, the passports lines. And um, and it's interesting that um, we see a lot of differentiation within the, the EU or within any countries based on, on, on nationality and, and passports. And, and this is uh, normalized in a sense because like, of course, because you come from another country, like it's normal that we treat you differently. But it's quite interesting that when you look at the figures and who is dying into the Mediterranean, 25, 27 now, thousand people have died for eight years and all are black and they are just told that they don't have the right passport and so I really think that they we need uh, to do more work about this ground of nationality slash citizenship and, and race because this ground of nationality and citizenship is usually taken I think uh, as a way to to mask deep racial uh, discrimination and, and inequalities. Yeah, um, in addition, maybe on the question of nationality um, that masks other grounds of inequality, I want to add that it also overlaps with social class. Um, we can see this in the European and German context when it comes to European citizens that come to Germany and have unequal access to residence status and to social assistance, um, to the child raising benefit. Uh, and we see here they are excluded based on their socioeconomic status of being unemployed and or looking for work. It often um, often women that are not married and look for little children um, are affected by those exclusions. So it has a gender dis um, gender dimension. And so um, we can see that nationality here is used to exclude 
European citizens from poorer countries, um, and this is actually a code for social class. Um, uh, thank you for the question, uh, Catherine. Um, uh, just to mention, in the Me Too Bell case, it was also there was an aspect of um, nationality because uh, those who were residents in Me Too Bell were largely urban Somali refugees, okay, and um, uh, migrants refugees. So the, there was the thing about language because there's a lot of talk about ethnic origin, social origin, rather than race. So is race the only word that can describe, you know, situations of nationality? Because in East African, there is a lot, the language is mainly ethnic, ethnicity. Um, and so, you know, in the case, it was about eviction of the, you know, informal settlements and not the luxurious uh, apartments that, you know, were next to them. So in the, the judge, uh, Justice Mumi Gogi at the High Court noted that, you know, there was an assumption of, criminality, you know, that violence resides in the downtrodden, and particularly, you know, those who are most marginalized, and in this case, there were those, uh, that aspect of, um, you know, residents being migrants and being refugees. Um, and then also, but then the court has dealt with it really well. Um, and then tying back to the question that Daniela asked, uh, um, and Daphne, it's all about, you know, are the courts the only solution? So I've also dealt with the case uh, Victoria Madong Taban, um, Stephen Kawai versus Council for Legal Education about the admission uh, of South Sudanese students to the bar um, to first of all sit the bar exams and be admitted as advocates of the high court because they had, these two are my friends, they have lived in Kenya all their lives um, and have studied in Kenya all their lives. But then when it went to you know, being admitted to the bar, they were told, okay, you were not, South Sudan was not envisioned to be part of the East African community when the Advocates Act was drafted in 1989, and so you wouldn't be admitted to the bar. And we were like, that's a you know, very weird you know, reason because it's now part of the East African Union and you, know, you should just read it in. Uh, but then we engaged in negotiation, or we, discussions with the Law Society of Kenya. The Law Society of Kenya you know, came in in support of the case. And then we also talked to the Council of Legal Education. They were also in support. And not just in that, but uh, you know, even in the case on uh, non-reformment of Somali refugees from Kenya, the case was brought by um, the Kenya Human Rights Commission. And so it brings in that aspect of fourth branch institutions protecting democracy, right? Because they also have a role to play and have played such an important role in uh, acting in cases as, inter as interested parties, in mediating, uh, in cases with uh, you know government actors, and in that being able to arrive at you know agreements, uh, you know recording, uh, you know agreements in court rather than you know having the full case being had. So there is there a space of these fourth branch institutions uh, to kind of alleviate all the burden that we want to place uh, in courts. And I would like to also add, it's also a challenge with hybrid regimes or when the, you have autocratic regimes because if the executive and the, gov uh, and the legislature are speaking with one voice, what recourse do the people have, right? So that's why, yes, it's unfair to you know, lean on the courts, but you know, that's the only thing uh, unless you want a revolution, which is always unpredictable. Right, as what you've seen in Egypt and Tunisia. So I'd like to just say that, you know, perhaps fourth branch institutions, but courts, sorry, <laughs> you know, you just have to deal with it. Catherine, I'm going to take a stab at your question. When is nationality discrimination, racial discrimination? I think the answer has to be in two parts. One, the question of when racial, when nationality discrimination is racial discrimination, you have to answer what is racial discrimination and whether there is an overlap between nationality as a category with racial grounds which are recognized um, wherever they are, whether constitutionally or internationally. The second part of that question is to be able to prove causally whether something did happen indeed on the basis of racial grounds. The first part of whether nationality comes within the inner circle of what we mean by racial grounds, we seem to be losing terribly on given how narrowly we understand what race is. Both within constitutional courts, there seems to be a trend, as well as internationally. So if we go back to the Students for Fair Admissions, the US Supreme Court 
decision from June 2023. Of course, it wasn't about nationality, but it is about traditional racial grounds such as color and how narrowly the majority is understanding what they think people taking a checkbox in an admissions applications mean. They think that they're checking into some kind of an objective category of color when what people in the admissions teams are thinking is that they're checking a, a, something called race and, and the list of races to signify the socioeconomic strata that you may come for. So race is not an objective category for the admissions team. They're looking at it as something which signifies something else, which is social, political, cultural, economic in nature. We are far from that understanding within, within I think, mainstream constitutional law jurisprudence where race is being seen now as a very objective, fixed category, which is something which the International Court of Justice says is something to be determined at birth. Right. So forget, forget about thinking about critical race theory where we're thinking in terms of race as a, as, as a social concept. We've gone several steps backward. Now, in that space, to want to argue nationality within the inner circle of racial categories, which are five in, in, in international law, race, color, ethnic origin, national origin, and descent, it is improbably hard to do that. The second problem is causation to actually show that something did happen on the basis of race, and I absolutely agree that often um, other markers are being used as a mask for racialized discrimination, but to actually prove that this is happening, it appears that the courts are often looking for smoking gun evidence. Unless racial epithets or racial slurs are used, it's very hard to be able to prove. And from last week's decision, if if um, anybody caught the, the Ukraine and Russian Federal decision from last Wednesday, which was in the merits on the Crimea case, which was the big case on ICSFT, the terrorism financing, but also on CERT, the Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, the key, it seems to be, not only the understanding of racialized grounds, which the court seemed to have got horribly wrong in understanding that a national minority doesn't seem to have anything which is racialized when it's talking about a political opposition to Russian aggression. So they de-link political opinion from race. That's one, and that's the first limb. Is this even race? The second limb was causation. They said, we don't see where's race in this. You won't see race because the expectation to find smoking gun evidence for racial discrimination is an expectation litigations won't be able to meet. And Ukraine indeed wasn't able to meet that expectation. So I think it's going to be incredibly hard to make claims um, not just on nationality discrimination, but anything which falls outside of the inner circle of categories accepted to be already grounds of discrimination. In fact, we're seeing a trend where grounds which have been accepted are being interpreted increasingly narrowly. So I think my suggestion in, in the piece that you're referring to is to think about moving away from grounds-based discrimination, moving away from using grounds as the gatekeepers, to be thinking, to be sort of orientating the courts toward thinking, what's the problem we're trying to solve here? And to orientate them towards the discrimination part of things rather than the grounds part of things. So I think in the inquiries that we have, discrimination inquiries, the first question we always ask as discrimination lawyers, did this happen on the ground of? And so ground is the way that you get to activate the rest of equality law. I would think we need to reverse the order on things and th talk about, well, what's your narrative? What exactly happened? What, what is wrong? And I think that's, that's coming back to what Kitty has always argued. Like, what's the substantive issue here? What's the problem? What's the problem of subordination here? And I think orientating, or at least opening up equality law, and, and equality law especially, to be talking about discrimination first and ground second might be a helpful way of, of, of asking judges to to, 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 to perhaps do more. I think the reason why we ask more from judges in equality law is perhaps because traditionally it's been treated as a civil political rights. It's also quite a technical field rather than, uh, rather than one which often has resource implications. It doesn't normally, although e income inequality is quite embedded in grounds. So I think that that openness of judges to be dealing with something which is possibly quite technical and something which constitutions mandate judges to do is a fair one, I would think. I don't see any, any 
hands up, which is which is a good thing. I think everyone can can now grab a cup of tea. Um, Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. We look forward to seeing you for the next panel, but grab some tea first. Coffee break. That will be fantastic. And if you could, if you just come back here uh, at 15 past uh, to start our next panel, that will be uh, really helpful. Thank you. So I know that you're all engaged in super interesting conversations. But if we want to have an actual lunch break where you will have more time to talk, let's continue the more formal conversation now. Thank you for taking your seats again. We'll start. Okay. This, yeah. Okay. I think our. Our panel is ready to start. Are you are you all ready to start again? Uh, our, our, all of our panelists are in place, and um, let me just give you a few seconds so you can all also take your seats before uh, we start our second uh, panel discussion today. So uh, welcome back, everybody, to our second roundtable. Uh, our second round table uh, is on uh, democratic backsliding, and I have an outstanding um, ensemble of, of panelists who have been thinking, writing uh, uh, about democratic backsliding for, uh, for quite some time in very multiple jurisdictions. So I'm incredibly excited to welcome our panel, and I think we're going to continue to have uh, some uh, outstanding conversations uh, here. Um, just to save a little bit of time, I'm not going to do long introductions. I'm only going to introduce our amazing uh, panelists with their names and affiliations, and I'm then going to hand over to our chair. Uh, today's chair uh, panel is going to be uh, chaired by uh, Miroslav Rzhikovsky. Um, he is a professor at the University of Warsaw, and he was also formerly uh, uh, a judge at the Constitutional uh, Tribunal of uh, Poland. And today uh, he's joined by Kimlein Schepele from Princeton University, Fiano de Londras from University of Birmingham, Mariana Valesco Riviera from Maynooth University, and David Kosar from Maastricht University. What an outstanding panel to talk about one of the most pressing challenges uh, to constitutional judging of our times. Over to you, Miroslav. Thank you for being with us today. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for inviting me here. I'm honored. And I would like, uh, first of all, to pay respect to uh, Susanne. Uh, I do not know a university who wouldn't be happy to have you uh, as a staff member, uh, as a professor. And we are so happy to be these days uh, to honor you. Chapeau uh, bas, cher ami. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I was asked to, uh, to be brief and sweet. I will, I will present you an uh, introduction from the Polish perspective of backsliding, but I do, uh, do swear to be brief, but I cannot be sweet. It will be rather bitter picture, or rather scratch. And uh, mm. I will use very thin, thick brush, and it, it will be the picture, uh, or uh, mm, mm, let's say, a, a, a scratch, uh, close to the scream of Edward Munch, as the, 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 the beauty of Renoir or Monet. But it is the, the situation in which we are in Poland now, and uh, you, all of you, you know that it was democratic elections of the president and of the parliament in 2015. <laughs> and afterwards started immediately the process of destroying of the Polish constitutionalism. Three pillars, today we are talking about three pillars, but then it was the firstly, the war 
against the constitutional tribunal. Secondly, it was the question of public media, grasp uh, to public media and transform it into the uh, governmental media. And the third element was civil service, replaced by nomenclatura. So it was the question of the very beginning. And then, because lack of qualified majority to change the constitution, the government changed the political <coughs> constitutional system in Poland via statutes, via decision of the parliaments, because the constitutional tribunal was switched off. Uh, then there is an open space to do what you really want to do, to do from the political, pure political perspective. And that was the questions of judiciary. And we now are in the situation in which 2,300 of 10,000 judges nominated after 2018 are unduly nominated judges. They cannot pretend to call themselves judges because the procedure based on the two stages, uh, opinion of the National Council of Judiciary and then nomination by the President of Poland. This first stage, nomination by the Council of Judiciary, is deficient because this Council of Judiciary is not anymore constitutional authority because 15 of 25 members, the judges, are not, as it was uh, till 2018, are not elected by their peers, by, but they are elected by the parliament. So purely political decision. Secondly, it was uh, the uh, um, element of the of the how to it, it was just example, but I want to to to, to show you how how process is going on, and uh, uh, it is not by accident. Uh, when I remember, uh, because of uh, uh, of the of the date of my birth, too, the situation in uh, Germany, indeed, in the occupation uh, uh, zones after Second World War, and to restore normality, they were 3D, democratization, demilitarization, uh, and denazification. Right, but how it happened in Poland, in reverse uh, mode, modus, it was firstly defamation, what's concerning institutions, defamation. Second, depreciation of the institution, then, deformation, then desactivation. It means, in German to say, uh, constitutional tribunal, zuerst Gleichschaltung, then Ausschaltung. Then is degeneration of the institution, following destruction, later on demoralization, also from the perspective of the public reason, and last stage, devastation of the constitutional order. So we have the, the situation in which the state authorities, the president, the parliament, the government, the prime minister, the first victim of the war against a uh, Constitution, the Polish Constitutional Tribunal, they perpetrated constitutional crime. Why? Because indeed, all of them, they fight it, destroyed their own constitution. What does it mean? That indeed, we may think what we lost in, uh, after eight years of this activity. Firstly, we lost constitutional identity. This identity, what was described in the decision of the Constitutional Court in the Lisbon Treaty the, uh, uh, decision, similarly to the German Lisbon Treaty. 
legislation. Secondly, we lost sovereignty. Sovereignty in the meaning of internal sovereignty. Because it is not the sovereign state in which its constitutional authorities are fighting against its own constitution. And all what happened was done by the constitutional authority. We lost a legal certainty and security, external and internal. External because just to call European arrest warrant and decision Selma case. <laughs> Internally, because if we have 2,300 neo judges that unduly nominated, that means that the, the, the parties of the, of the procedure may ask to reverse the decision of the court because the court is not duly established by law. We lost parliamentarism because parliament was not anymore, but it was just a well-greased machinery to adopt any kind of uh, decisions. And it means that uh, we have uh, uh, reached the stage in which, sorry, in which I, because of hostile takeover of the mechanism of the state, we reached the stage of constitutionally failed state. And it is indeed the situation in which we have uh, 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 to, to see how indeed uh, the state and the society and the structure of the society responded on this situation. And just to very brief, firstly, manifestations on the streets, it was the fight against the, what uh, all these elements I described. Secondly, it was the, the situation in which the NGOs, uh, Association of the Judges, of the Independent Public Prosecutor, think tanks, they prepared and prepared and prepared opinion and statements and was the, the, the mirror for the government, what was done. It was the question also of reaction of international institutions. And, and uh, one of the elements we discussed yesterday that uh, because of the non-existence of the constitutional tribunal to international courts, ECJ and Strasbourg, they replaced <laughs> Polish constitutional court and by decisions and by arguments, they, these two courts, they gave a foundation, intellectual, legal, uh, political legitimacy as well, a uh, uh, value uh, um, added legitimacy to, to this, uh, to this uh, 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 events to uh, events of uh, uh, of the uh, new uh, uh, situation it should be uh, managed and at the very end uh, democratic backsliding 15th of October last year parliamentary elections what happened indeed society stopped the process of fascization of the Polish state. And uh, now it is the question, how to deal with the past? Mm -hmm. It means, should be the constitution obstacle to restore constitutionalism? Why, for example, there is a regulation concerning the status of judges, irremovability of judges. Should this guarantee be applied to all judges also means neo-judges, they are not judges from the perspective of the Constitution. Another question is the problem whether the new government may use nocive regulations which uh, intended to block a situation uh, uh, of, uh, for the future to restore the uh, constitutional system. Uh, because we, sorry, we, uh, 
Thank you for understanding. We, uh, we opposed fiercely uh, to this regulation of the uh, former government. But now to restore the, uh, the, 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 the uh, constitutionality, probably it will be necessary to use these instruments. But uh, Venice Commission, I know some members being here, uh, will, will answer this question, whether it is proper decision or not. Uh, and we, uh, I have no time to explain uh, all details, but, but uh, it was a tough time uh, till 15th of uh, October. But now it's even tougher from the perspective of restoring constitutionalism to avoid for the future the risk and potential of continuity of use of not absolutely clean and clear instruments for better result. And my answer is that indeed it is the higher loyalty and it is loyalty to the Constitution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and Kim, please start your okay. presentation. Hi. So can you hear me? Great. So first of all, I'm really delighted to to that Mirek laid out what the problems are in Poland. They're even worse in Hungary, where I've uh, sort of camped out for the last 30 years. Um, because in Hungary, they did it all legally, constitutionally. And they also rigged the election rules so that it's not really possible to actually have a free and fair election that will bring a democratic government back. Um, and so what I want to do in this little talk, first of all, is to say, this is a talk in the spirit of Susanna Baer, who has taught me so much. And this is a talk that is, what would Susanna do <laughs> if she were in this position, being a judge? And so what I want to do is come back to the question of judging, the role of judging in the context of democratic backsliding. And I think it's important to start, actually, with a more optimistic note, which is to say, if we think about what Europe or what the world looked like at the end of World War II, devastated, also determined to not repeat what brought the war about and what happened during that war, um, that at first it started with a lot of human rights conventions. Then it actually was elaborated by a lot of brave judges. And while we all see the limitations of the jurisprudence that was created, I think sometimes we miss the extraordinary accomplishment of trying to make rights real. And there is no better testament um, to the fact that actually rights were made real in many ways, not perfectly, but also there's a culture of critique within which we can talk about how to make things better. There's no greater testament to the solidity of the rights culture that has developed in many places since World War II that the new autocrats who come to power do not engage in mass human rights violations like their 20th century predecessors. They know that if they simply lock up the opposition or torture them or shut down the media by force or simply limit uh, free speech or do all of the things and certainly you know mass arrests and torture and killings they know that if they do that the world community will say something however so what's happening is that in many countries Poland being one Hungary being another autocrats come to power usually the first time through free and fair elections and then what they do is they they leave mass rights violations to the side because they know the culture of rights will catch them out if they do it, or at least there will be loud screams and criticisms. So instead what they do is they deconstruct checks and balances, and they want to disable all the independent institutions that would tell them that they can't do what they want. And the original challenge to this is that the human rights framework, including at first the transnational human rights framework, has individual rights to deploy. <laughs> the judges on transnational courts have lots of rights, but that doesn't necessarily reach into the constitutional regimes of countries that are disabling checks and balances. 
that are limiting constitutional review. If you look at all the democracy rating agencies, they will always tell you that the countries that wind up at the very top are Nordic countries. And you look at their constitutional structures, and they have unicameral parliaments, they have limited judicial review. In other words, they don't have a lot of checks on the system. And so what you see is autocrats starting to imitate Nordic democracy. Let's eliminate upper chambers. Happened in Venezuela, happened in Ecuador. Um, let's eliminate or cut back judicial review because after all, the best democracies don't even have it. And so what's happening is that you see autocrats hiding behind the structure of sort of democratic governments and there's a limit to what, how you can reach these things through rights, or at least so we thought. <laughs> and so this is where I want to say, so first of all, what's a court to do as it's being attacked and packed and so on? Um, and this is where I want to say that Poland and Israel have actually done a lot better than countries like Hungary, um, because people went to the streets to defend the courts. I mean, in Israel, where the, where the Supreme Court has been under massive assault by the government, there were hundreds of thousands of people coming out week after week after week to try to defend the Supreme Court and the judiciary. In Poland, there were many demonstrations that were, you know, save our judges. I mean, it was quite dramatic, right, to try to back up the judiciary. It doesn't always work because the more entrenched the autocrats are, the more they're going to do what they want anyway. But at least if there is some public outcry, it means that the judiciary still is something in which people have hope, right? So the question is how to restore that if the courts are packed, if the courts are under attack. With luck, the going to the streets will prevent the destruction. You know, so first I want to second what Daniela Salazar said yesterday, the most important thing is for courts that are in the process of being attacked to go on doing what they should be doing and not to be cowed and bullied by the attacks. Um, and the second thing is if the courts actually wind up being captured. I think there's actually starting to be a kind of ray of hope. And this is what I call turning rights into structures. This is something very new. It's happening in a number of the transnational courts. It's, it, it's accelerated massively in the last five years. And what do I mean by that? So the transnational courts, um, I'm thinking here of the European Court of Human Rights, the Inter-American Court, but also even the European Court of Justice, now that it's got a bit of a Bill of Rights to work with and some other resources as well, what you see is that these countries have taken individual rights, their jurisdiction, and asked a slightly different question than they used to ask before. And the question they're asking is, okay, so you have a right to a fair trial. We're not just going to look at whether you had a fair trial, but what it would take to guarantee a fair trial in general in your country. And so you start seeing courts, the ECJ has done this, the ECHR has done it, the Inter-American Court actually got, kind of got there first, unfortunately, because it had Peru and Ecuador to work with before that. Um, and what these courts have been saying is that the individual right to a fair trial requires that governments maintain an independent judiciary. And then they start to elaborate what it is that that means. So they're turning an individual right into a structural requirement that states have to meet. You're starting to see it also now in the area of election administration, where the courts, and again, the, the, leading, the leading court is actually the African Court of Human Rights. They've gotten there first, but the, the European Court of Human Rights has started to develop a, a jurisprudence on this, where the question is, what does it mean to have a right to vote? And so instead of just asking whether your personal vote was realized, the courts then say, well, what would it take to guarantee that a right to vote is possible? And so you start seeing them backing into, there's a great uh, court decision out of the African Court of Human Rights, saying that what this requires is neutral election administration that's not in fact captured by the governing party um, or in another decision that opposition parties have to have equal access to the public as governing parties, for example. And again, this is out of a human rights court where all the, all the textual resources they have to work with are individual rights but they're starting to convert rights into structures. And then my sort of last example is one from the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Um, one of the dilemmas that has encouraged autocracy in, in Latin America has been the fact that autocrats come to power and the first thing they want to 
get rid of are term limits on presidential systems, and they're all presidential systems. So uh, Colombia sent a reference to the, inter the Inter-American Court and said, so is there any, um, and this is the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, which is to say what they have to work with are individual rights. And the Colombian uh, government sends a reference, and the reference is, so is there any requirement of term limits that comes with the individual right to vote or to be elected? And the Inter-American Court takes the reference, and what they say, and it's a, it's a really quite moving opinion, is that, is that the right to vote and the right to be elected presupposes a system in which democratic rotation is possible. And one of the things we know about the abolition of term limits is that it's usually a bad sign, because if somebody is an incumbent for a very, very long period of time, they can appoint all the judges on a constitutional court, they can appoint all of the representatives in independent agencies, all of this tends to have a corrosive effect on democratic governance, and so backing into the right to vote, the right to vote and the right to be elected is insecure as long as there is there's an unlimited possibility of re-election of the president. So I mentioned these cases, all of these are decided in the last five years. <laughs> Um, because I'm starting to see this as a kind of a trend in the transnational courts, that they're taking individual rights and turning them into democratic structures. So why does this matter? It matters a lot, I hope, now in Poland. You've been talking about this. Because one of the debates going on in Poland, now that they have a democratic government, is to say, now what do we do? And there are two philosophies uh, arguing in a democratic and open and rather heated manner. In fact, I got into a debate with one of our Polish colleagues in Princeton the other day and we disturbed everybody in the restaurant. Um, there's a big debate about whether you follow through on Donald Tusk's promise that if elected, he would sweep out all of the former government's political appointees with an iron broom, meaning just fire them all. And then there's another group that says, well, wait a second, what makes us different from them? <laughs> You know, we come in and we fire everybody that doesn't agree with us and we appoint our people. It's just going to be tit for tat forever. And so here's the solution, it seems to me, that one of the things we should think about when we think about the rule of law is not just the rule of law as it applies within one country, where we think about the predictability and regularity and legal certainty and following legal methods and so on. I think about this because, of course, in Hungary, nothing was actually illegal when they did it <laughs> to consolidate power in this way. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is that, of course, many countries, Poland being one, Hungary being another, the Latin, so, you know, Daniela's court, and, and we have, I mean, all of the courts in Latin America are, are embedded in systems in which their transnational courts are saying, in order to be a member of this club, there are transnational standards for democracy for judicial independence and for the realization of rights that are part of your legal system. You sign these conventions. You are bound by the decisions of these courts. And so it seems to me one of the options for Poland, especially since there are unfortunately so many cases out of both the European Court of Justice and the, the European Court of Human Rights that have Poland's name on them, right, is to just start by saying let's comply with those decisions. In other words, not the language of the iron broom where you simply fire everybody, but the Court of Human Rights, for example, has held the constitutional court is improperly constituted, therefore not a tribunal according to law. Several chambers of the Supreme Court in Poland, also the same. So start, a new government should start by saying, we're going to engage not in what I call the rule of law writ small, where we only look at the rule of law inside the boundaries of Poland, Hungary, whatever, but we think instead about what I call the rule of law writ large, which is to say, counting not only the domestic requirements under the Constitution, whatever that Constitution has turned out to be, if you have a constitutional majority and the whole thing's been rewritten, but instead to think, so we're embedded in a transnational system in which that gives us other rule of law um, requirements. So the rule of law writ large may mean bringing the domestic system into line with the transnational system and that's a way out, I think, if we can ever get democratic governments back into these places, following the transnational courts will be a, a roadmap, which may, means that the new Democrats don't just mirror the tactics of the new autocrats, <laughs> but that they do something better and bigger. And this is where, for all the judges in the room, we're all counting on models <laughs> that will actually be present when we can bring these governments back to democratic order again. And so judging under constitutional challenges, 
may mean thinking about how to provide a roadmap for when the Democrats come back. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me start, as many have done, by uh, congratulating Susanna on this day and the tribute that it pays to you and your career that so many colleagues have come together um, to honour you today and to thank Catherine, Nora and Bashak for, for putting it together and indeed the um, dozen or so students from their various institutions who are uh, doing an awful lot of backroom work here keeping us all going. So thank you very much. Um, I want to pick up actually on the transnational theme and to give it perhaps a slightly different flavour. Um, in doing so, I don't want to suggest that transnational, and I'll focus on the European Court of Human Rights, hasn't done incredibly important work in terms of addressing democratic backsliding uh, in Europe. And indeed, we've spoken about some of those cases, incredibly important cases about judicial independence and elections and so on uh, since we've come together yesterday. But even bearing that in mind, I want to suggest um, that there are three things we should perhaps be slightly conscious of or wary of um, in terms of thinking about the court's capacity to continue uh, in its mission or part of its mission, which is to support democracy um, and a set of uh, European <laughs> core European uh, norms around democracy and human rights across the continent, not necessarily per se in cases of really manifest democratic corrosion. Some things are obvious. You pack a court, you disestablish a court, etc. Other things perhaps don't look quite as obvious as, as obviously uh, to be democratic backsliding, but are nevertheless, I would suggest, indicators of a democratic decay or degradation that is nevertheless extremely um, concerning. Um, and, and indeed, even though as my accent will give away, I am not British, I live in the United Kingdom. So I am thinking about the, my context in which I live as well when I frame some of these remarks. So I want to make three short suggestions. The first suggestion uh, is that we ought to be very attentive to moments or ways in which the um, quite appropriate normative commitment to subsidiarity, that is to shared responsibility between national authorities and the Strasbourg court, and indeed to primary responsibility of national authorities for, uh, the, uh, for giving effect to the convention and its rights, we ought to be attentive to instances in which that normative commitment becomes concessionary. In other words, where the court develops approaches to subsidiarity that are in fact concessions to um, dilatory, uh, how will I put this, rejections of its authority to decide on states' compliance with the convention. Uh, I'll pick particularly up on process-based review in that context. So there is, of course, a very good argument for process-based review, which includes the argument that we were beginning to talk about earlier. We might call it the Robert Spano-style democracy-enhancing approach to process-based <laughs> review. But to some extent, process-based review as its practice makes, makes a number of assumptions about democratic rigor and health within countries. Uh, which a number of countries, including the United Kingdom, benefit from to uh, get a high degree of deference to a national decision. And that continues to be the case, notwithstanding the fact that there is manifest, repeated, concerted and institutional resistance to human rights as standards that limit what the state may do, including in parliamentary debates. And of course, very recently, a set of parliamentary debates that were, in fact, framed around legislation deliberately and proudly designed to contravene international law. So process-based review and other um, manifestations of subsidiarity, of course, have an important role to play, but we must be conscious of not allowing them to become <laughs> concessionary and thus to miss indications of democratic decay particularly where we might conventionally not expect to see them. The second point is a recognition point. 
Um, as I said, you know, things like judicial independence or free and fair elections are sort of manifest or obvious locations where you would see democratic decay. Um, but there are other um, indications of democratic decay or democratic backsliding that are infrequently categorized within that frame. Uh, here I'm particularly thinking about regression in social rights and in, for example, reproductive rights. So when reproductive rights regression <coughs> is constructed merely as about privacy, for example, or given a very wide margin of appreciation, which is the court's approach to abortion in particular, we miss the fact that regression on reproductive rights, as my colleague Atina Krajewska has beautifully written about, is often a quite subtle but important route towards broad democratic backsliding because it reflects a coalition of particular interests working together to degrade rights protection and to reframe certain issues as being for the national, uh, certain issues as being for the private that we had been working so hard to recognize as being issues that also have resonance on different scales, including the transnational scale. And the final point then that I'll suggest we might be, uh, so the court, sorry, I should finish that thought, uh, the European Court of Human Rights is very far behind the rest of international human rights law in respect of reproductive rights, particularly in respect of abortion rights, uh, and routinely misses opportunities to recognise uh, what other things that may be happening in regression in that space. And the final point then is, uh, I think, something that's been subtly running under uh, what we've been talking about and the fact that we're gathered here today in the combination of people that we are. And that is that a reflection my colleague Erica Rackley has often made about gender compositions of courts and domestic levels uh, is important when we think about all compositions of courts at all levels. And that is, she says, when we realize that judging matters, we realize that who judges also matters. So that we should also be attentive to tendencies to place or nominate for the European Court of Human Rights judges who are not, you know, manifestly anti-constitutionist or anti-law or anti-the convention, but are increasingly restrained, is the, the uh, uh, term that I-Courts has used in some of its empirical work on this, and recognizing that in the last five to ten years, levels of restraint, that is not finding violations or not finding violations on, the, on some articles that may be raised in cases, uh, has increased, particularly in relation to... Uh, so-called consolidated democracies um, across Europe. Uh, we see tendencies to have a different approach to judging, and we should also be attentive to those. Now, I think what all of this points to, and indeed what many of the conversations we are having in general points to, is that even though all, these, all our structures, our doctrines, our, and our norms really are important, Fundamentally, what makes all of them work, either to maintain constitutionalism in the face of crisis or for it to degrade, is a constitutionalist mindset and disposition among the actors within those institutions. In an ideal world, we might expect that that would exist at the domestic level, primarily with the executive and legislature, so that the role of courts is less central to these issues. But when it doesn't exist or isn't manifest there, it must exist in courts. And when it doesn't or can't exist in domestic courts, it must exist in our supranational courts. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona, uh, very much. And uh, now, uh, Mariana, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, uh, thank you um, to the organizers, Nora, Catherine, and Bashak. Um, it's a huge honor uh, for me to be here, so thank you. Um, so, um, and also to the students as well. Uh, thank you, Fiona, for reminding uh, us about that very important uh, labor. Um, so, okay, so um, once I already express my, my uh, gratefulness. I want you to give um, a bit, I, I, want, I want to give uh, you a bit of a background where I'm, uh, to like, you know, explain where I'm coming from. So uh, the paper that I wrote is um, mainly informed by uh, the experience of the Mexican uh, case, in particular uh, the last six years. 
um, democratic life uh, has eroded very quickly um, in, in, yeah, in the last um, five years uh, or so. Um, so that, like, you should take that into account. I am looking, uh, as uh, James uh, Joyce would say, the universal in the particular, and I think um, um, the, Mexican, the Mexican case is very instructive to sort of like um, rethink what we have been already thinking uh, in the last um, two decades or so uh, regarding um, democratic ba backsliding. So uh, the paper is entitled The Soft Guardrails guard, guard um, of uh, Legal Constitutionalism. Um, and what I'm saying uh, in the paper, in very simple terms, is that um, we are facing a crisis in public ethics um, um, that, is mani that manifests itself um, by the lack of uh, mutual tol toleration and institu institutional forbearance. Mm -hmm. um, I am borrowing uh, clearly from um, a, a Levitsky's and Sibelat's uh, idea of the soft guardrails of, of democracy and the norms, uh, institutional form forbearance and uh, mutual tol toleration as norms uh, that essentially are sort of like the last hope to save um, democracy. So what I'm saying is that uh, both mutual toleration and institutional forbearance are critical not only to, like for the survival of democracy, but in particular for the survival of legal constitutionalism as, you know, a model to adjudicate, um, you know, not only questions of rights, but also uh, questions uh, of politics as Daniela was um, uh, referring uh, to <laughs> yesterday. So, now, while the institutional forbearance uh, and mutual toleration, at least in my mind, it's very clear um, um, when, when you think about it, like when it flows from ex the, the executive branch and the legislative branch to the judiciary, it is not so clear to me how it flows back. I do think that like this, like the, 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 the two, the, the two uh, norms work in the, other, in the other way, but I think it, like it works in a different way. I am trying to think, and I, like I should actually we appreciate um, thoughts from the audience, like how, like how exactly um, the, the, <coughs> these norms flow from the judiciary to the other branches, uh, but I do think that, um, that, it, that it works. Um, so what I am, um, so the, the institutional forbearance and mutual toleration uh, uh, from executive to the judiciary and legislative to the, to the judiciary, I try to um, illustrate it um, in the paper uh, with examples of uh, Mandela in South Africa in the transitional, in the transitional uh, period and with Biden in the US with uh, the, the, um, uh, the case um, that the Supreme Court uh, decided uh, in Dobbs, uh, the reaction to that, uh, to that uh, decision. And of course, like in the sort of like in the extreme of the, of the spectrum, I am like analyzing offering Mexico as the extreme case of absolute lack of mutual toleration and institu institutional forbearance in the sense that <laughs> like they, like the government, in particular the president, does not engage in the arguments of the courts or like whatsoever, whatever it's in, you know, the, the in a contradiction to the, the government's interest is going to be automatically disregarded as corrupt, as, you know, the judiciary is responding to dark interests um, and we are, you know, sort of like, I am the voice of, of the people and I am the, like the, the one that is right and whatever goes against me is, is by definition uh, suspect. Um, and and consequently should essentially disappear just like this week um, after, again, like as I said at the beginning, um, just this week, I guess like the, the, the cherry on, on top of the last uh, uh, six years is that like the president pre presented a constitutional amendment proposal to essentially abolish the judiciary as we know it, to institute um, a popular election of judges. So, um, Again, like again, I don't think. I hope. <laughs> I don't know if I don't think, but I hope that this is not. This is just a political move to sort of like um, capture the the electoral campaign because we have presidential ele elections this year. Uh, but in any case, um, the fact that it's like the the proposal is a serious proposal, and in that, like it has been tabled, um, it's it's very very uh, concerning. Um, so. Um, so this is just to say that I, I think that um, institutional forbearance and, and, and mutual toleration is uh, 
very important, very important two norms to to for the survival of legal constitutionalism. But I I I'm still trying to understand how that those norms norms flow from the judiciary to the to the executive. Um, I don't know if I will have to um, have to rethink the, the framework of the paper actually uh, because again like if it doesn't work it doesn't work uh, but based on but based on what we what we have discussed so far and also like uh, uh, building on what we uh, the conversation we had yesterday it seems to me that there is a consensus um, here and please correct me if I'm wrong if, if I'm wrong that like courts uh, not only should do something uh, to protect um, so to say, legal constitutionalism, uh, as we know it, but also that they can do it, as you know, uh, the papers in this uh, uh, panel sort of like are exploring. Um, I am not like I. I think I'm gonna like maybe come across as <laughs> the conservative in the in the room, which is actually surprising to me because I do like I do think that they that that courts should do something. But again, based on the on the Mexican experience, I I I'm growing convinced to the idea that in moments like this, the less courts do, it's the better in the, like, just like, you know, in, in, in the long run, like for the sur survival of, of um, for their own survival. Um, so also, uh, I think, uh, again, like this is not to say that like the, that the uh, that the, the papers that are presented here are not are not valuable. Like they are, I think they're like they are uh, excellent and 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 very uh, useful to think to think the ways in which courts can can respond to this. But I do want to emphasize uh, one thing that it's that the underlying assumptions of the papers and perhaps the the, the conversation that we were having yesterday is that is that um, there are so the assumption is that there are there will be good faith actors on the other side of the of the of the counter willing to comply with the decisions of the courts so if we don't have that and this is the point that i'm trying to to make right now if we don't have good faith actors on as as counterparts then courts are essentially not they don't have many many ways to 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 do much um I don't want to be pessimistic, but like this is just like I would like to discuss like what to do, what do, what do we do about that that <laughs> assumption. Uh, so anyway, so this brings me to the last very brief point that I want to make is that like the sort of like the the lesson that, I tr that I'm trying to draw in the paper is that like since courts are defenseless defenseless in some contexts, then we should perhaps shift our attentions to the political branches and like explore what exactly are the you know the the factors that enable uh, the enable actors to sort of like be just like not 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 uh, comply to to the norms of institutional for forbearance and mutual toleration. And one of the things that I think might be worth exploring is how the new communication ecosystem basically enables uh, that sort of uh, behavior. And the other thing uh, that I think it's worth uh, exploring is also party finance in the sense that, you know, the way in which parties are, are funded also has an impact on um, a accountability. So this is just, and this is the, the part that I haven't finished of the paper, so I'm going to stop there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mariana and David. Uh, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? So first of all, thank you very much, uh, Basha, Catherine, Nora, and Suzanne for having me here. Uh, I know that I'm standing between you and the lunch, so I shall be brief, but uh, probably not sweet. So in my paper, I argue that the nature of polit uh, polarization of Western societies, or at least many of them, has changed. So uh, basically, this typical left versus right axis is uh, being abandoned and being replaced by, uh, by the increasing uh, <coughs> competition between the tiny globalized elite and the basically largely locally bound precariat, or let's call it ordinary people. Don't ask me why. Read the paper by Kim called The Party is Over. She nailed it. So uh, the problem is that the traditional parties have not been able uh, uh, basically, those that have been built around this left versus right continuum have not been able to respond to 
uh, this uh, shift to global uh, local axis uh, properly. And the big, the big question is whether the apex courts can do that. And uh, and I argue that, uh, I mean, focus primarily on Europe, that the apex courts should uh, adapt to this changing political landscape and try to find a way how to address the concerns of not only these cosmopolitan globalist elites, but also the nationalist localist precariat. If they fail, well, probably the ordinary people will not care about the fate uh, of these uh, of these courts. So first, I'll make a short detour. I must say that I'm not a big fan of the term backsliding uh, for several reasons, uh, because it presupposes some golden age of democracy. And we have already heard from Catherine in the morning, not necessarily the case. And of course, I mean, resisting democratic backsliding shouldn't be only about protecting the status quo, but also accommodating and transforming the society. The second trouble I have with this term is that uh, it focuses predominantly on intentional dismantling of democracies. And I think that the major problem is also, let's say, the, the thing what I, which I would refer to as a passive state, <laughs> basically the inaction, not only, you know, by autocrats, but also by Democrats. Uh, think of, you know, state incapacity, Mark Tashnet and uh, Hosla. Think of executive underage. Kim wrote another nice paper about that during the COVID era. Think of, you know, institutional failure, Michaela Halberner, or democratic, you know, or dysfunctions and legislative burdens of inertia. So that's a big problem with inaction uh, as, uh, uh, as uh, well. So. I think that's something we need to uh, we need to be aware of. So let's return to the question: Why apex courts can easily be portrayed as elitist, as uh, not caring about you know the fates of sorry uh, fates of ordinary people? First of all, some of them are elitist by design. I mean, if they are traditional Kazanian courts. There is no individual constitutional complaint, no amparo, ordinary people can't reach the court. Well, why should they care? And even in Poland, the individual constitutional complaint has been limited because you have to challenge the law that is applied by the ordinary courts. And therefore, I think the Polish constitutional court had some troubles to find attraction uh, with the people and, and their support a little bit. Second, the courts, apex courts, can be portrayed as elitist because it's very expensive to bring cases to them, at least in certain countries. Well, I think of bringing cases to the US Supreme Court. Uh, it's not going to be cheap. Uh, they can, of course, be portrayed elitist because of the way they decide, but also they can be portrayed as elitist uh, because of the way some of its judges behave. And by this, I mean not only on the bench, but also off the bench and some of the controversial uh, extrajudicial activities. So. Basically, the precariat may not view these courts as their courts, but rather as elitist courts that they care about uh, the needs of only certain social class. So uh, what the apex courts can do about that, of course, I don't have a perfect playbook, but I suggest four strategies. Uh, first concerns in media and communication strategy. Second is about proactive engagement with, uh, with the precariat, the third one, it's about avoiding controversial extrajudicial activities by judges. And of course, the fourth one is responsive judging and avoiding the structural judicial uh, bias. In my paper, I have uh, examples from all over the world. Here, I'll focus on a couple of them, primary uh, on those in Germany. I have no future in German academia, so I guess I can say things that many of you probably can't. So pardon my uh, uh, lack of uh, diplomacy. So if we look at the media, media and communication uh, strategy, uh, the typical example of elitist behavior by, by excellence was the so-called Justiz Press Conference of the German Federal Constitutional Court. And, Mich uh, and Sylvia Steininger wrote a wonderful piece forthcoming in German Law Journal about that, which was basically about, you know, providing you know, summaries of judgments of the you know, constitutional court today in advance to a certain group of privileged journalists. It was dismantled already, heavily criticized. Uh, another example might be a wonderful uh, documentary made by the German Federal Constitutional Court uh, about its work. It's great, look at it. But if you want to reach out to precariat, well, it should be 20 times shorter. Uh, so turn the documentary into a clip you know, and make, uh, make sure 
uh, that uh, it's uh, it can be in share, uh, it can be shared over the social media and all over there. The second group concerns proactive engagement <laughs> with the people, either via social events or we are holding hearings outside the country, uh, sorry, outside the court seat, which is an example of the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom. Uh, I think that it held recently meetings in Edinburgh, Car Cardiff, Belfast, Manchester, and elsewhere. So that's a way how to reach out to the people. We can think of also the open door celebration at the Supreme Court uh, on Canada Day, introduced by the Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin, and there are all sorts of those, you know, measures that can be taken. Well, controversial of the bench activities of judges. So we all know that some judges. Uh, charge pretty high rates for some private lecturing for law, law firms uh, and having excessive additional income for this activity, not only in the Eastern Europe, but also in Western Europe. Uh, there is this problem of the revolving door phenomenon, basically judges traveling among the branches, uh, has been traditionally considered fine in certain countries, including Germany, but it's, I think it raises uh, big uh, concerns. Of course, some judges may act as arbitrators or write you know, expert opinions. And again, it might be viewed uh, very controversially. And of course, landing a job after finishing the judicial career, there have been some you know, controversies here uh, in Germany and elsewhere as well. It's a problem uh, also in, in, uh, in the United uh, Kingdom uh, too. So that's something we need to probably think about, also about the changing the role of a judge acting off the bench and you know, challenge the assumptions we uh, have had about these activities before because times have changed. And uh, very quickly on responsive judging and avoiding structural judicial bias, I will give Germany a break and I will use an example uh, from, from the Czech Republic where you can see that the judges of the Constitutional Court uh, do not, I mean, view certain issues from the helicopter point of view because they issued like you know 15 judgments concerning judicial judicial salaries finding basically <laughs> without any explicit hook in the Czech constitution just basically on the principle of judicial independence that judicial salaries can't be reduced can't be even frozen so basically uh, introducing the, the American rule in a sense without the explicit uh, without the ex explicit hook no matter whether it is, you know, economic crisis, financial crisis, energetic crisis, I mean, judicial salaries are fine. But in contrast, when there is, you know, some uh, very abrupt uh, slash in pensions, adopted a very, you know, short legislative, you know, procedure, controversial one, then of course, I mean, it's social rights. We exercise judicial restraint and we leave it as it is and uh, give the government the green line. So of course, this can be easily exploited uh, by, uh, by the potential autocratic leaders. Czech Republic is doing relatively fine, but it's like many other countries, one election away from a disaster uh, in, in this region. So this is something that probably judges should, should address and think about carefully. As I say, if they fail, they might have troubles and people might not care about their fate. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, David. And following the excellent exercise and pattern of the first session, uh, I would like to invite you to present your questions. Three, and then we will continue. Yes, one, two, three. Yes, uh, please here. Uh, two, uh, Daphne. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you for a wonderful panel. Uh, it's more of a footnote to the last uh, presentation. I, I totally agree that uh, courts and judges all over the world are perceived as elitist. And I do agree also with some of your proposals. But I want to add a warning. I don't think that if we just behave a little bit better, as you uh, uh, tend to recommend, this will necessarily change our perception, uh, will change our being perceived as elitist. Uh, because, I, and I can give an, because I think it's something more entrenched. I mean, I agree that judges should uh, uh, behave uh, 
ethically if they don't, etc. And uh, <laughs> I mentioned here uh, in another conversation that personally I'm the, the chairperson of the ethics committee of, of uh, the judicial system in Israel, so I, I wholeheartedly believe in that. But take for example, and just a minor example, and I don't want to, I want to be brief, uh, case law of the Israeli Supreme Court and maybe other Supreme Courts on asylum seekers. We had many uh, unpopular and important, I think, decisions on rights of asylum seekers, uh, protecting their liberty, social rights, etc. These were highly unpopular, but beyond being unpopular, they were uh, described as elitist. Why? Because if the Supreme Court judges care about asylum seekers, they, and th this was the manipulation or the argument made, because they don't care about the poor people of the poor neighborhoods of Tel Aviv, because where will these asylum seekers go to? They will go to live in their neighborhoods. They will not be the neighbors of, of the judges. I, I'm just, you know, quoting. So here it's something more entrenched, because even if we do what we are supposed to do, we will be perceived as elitists. So, uh, I, so I share uh, your sentiments, but I think that the problem is, is, is deeper. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, my name is Mark Dawson. I'm from the Hertie School, and I'm also an EU lawyer, so um, apologies that my, my question comes from, from that angle. And um, one thing that, that to me wasn't really placed in the center of the discussion, which is why I want to bring it up, is actually the Polish election itself and the significance of that election, right? Because from an EU law perspective, and what I observe, kind of what the EU, for example, has done in relation to democratic and rule of law backsliding, is it's developed all sorts of tools and techniques, right? We've had Article 7, we've had conditionality, we've had Article 19 jurisprudence, we've had Article 2 jurisprudence. And the question might be, what was that all good for when ultimately what even offered the opportunity for constitutional renewal, offered the opportunity for kind of rule of law erosion to be remedied in Poland was the fact that the Polish people <laughs> threw the scoundrels out, right? They, they made this transformative change. So what, what reflections can we take from that? Does that mean actually that you, when we're thinking about the role of constitutional courts and the role of transnational courts in protecting constitutional courts, that actually their attention shouldn't primarily be directed at courts really and directed at these sort of techniques, but should be more directed at the political process and ensuring a certain pluralism in the political process. So, so sort of the, 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 the paper on Mexico, I think has maybe some critical questions perhaps for, for the European case in, in that regard. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, and uh, yes. <laughs> Okay, so uh, thank you for excellent, excellent panel. Uh, I'm, I'm just serving in a section dealing with, uh, now, with Polish and uh, Hungarian cases. And I would like uh, to thank to, to, if I may use the first name, to, to Miroslav, uh, <laughs> for problematizing the issue of restoring constitutionalism in Poland. The European Court of Human Rights, as we all know, gave, uh, so to say, its, its reply towards the rule of law crisis in, in Poland. The reply that we got concerning execution of our judgment was not satisfactory last year. And also, I personally took part in, in um, several interim measures, orders, which actually were not respected last year. But we got additional and new information that the, the, the now they are respected. And this was, just to echo what Kim finally concluded, I think very good example of judicial responsibility and help in, um, so to say, restoring democracy and, uh, so to say, answering judicial way how to actually um, help, help uh, democracy to get back. Uh, or in the, in the state when it was challenged. Uh, in, uh, 
Intulea versus uh, Poland, but also in Zeda. The court, uh, mm, I would say, replied to the situation in, 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 uh, based on, on the principle we, we, we established, but also in concreto, uh, in, in the context, which was also surprising, because it is an EU country. I wouldn't be surprised to have it and we witnessed it for, for other countries out of the EU. But then we had this in Poland. And in Hungary, uh, the situation, again, is uh, different, but annoying, I would say. And uh, uh, I'm talking in my personal capacity, of course. I'm, I'm not talking on behalf of the court in, in, or, or the university I was affiliated with uh, prior to taking up this position. But mm, I, I, we, uh, it, it, is, it, is really, it is really hard to be a European judge now uh, with all these backsliding issues. Uh, and uh, I was personally very happy when in this abortion case, ML versus Poland, I didn't stay alone, but three judges and, you know, uh, uh, were in that minority. So we are totally aware in the court, I would say, and I am aware, as Fiona said, that the court in Strasbourg uh, is uh, behind other international bodies concerning reproductive rights, especially abortion. But contrary to surrogacy and the process-based review, where only one judge dissented, this time we had, so there is a development, we are working on that, we are very uh, aware, but uh, also with cons uh, about the constraints of 46 countries having different legislation and different traditions in this aspect. Uh, so I hope that you also recently that we quote more and more international courts and the, and, and the treaty bodies as well, especially the Human Rights Committee. Uh, and it is important that we have this vision, I would say, that European protection of human rights is just a part of universal protection of human rights because this is a, 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 a global, a global uh, phenomenon. Now, uh, I, I cannot talk about one case that I'm very much uh, worried about. It is Karsai versus Hungary about euthanasia. But I would really like to hear, if possible, because this is life matter things, think. Uh, um, as we all know, Hungary has that legislation which prohibits euthanasia, like many countries in Europe. But, differently to other countries, that country actually prohibits Every, any, uh, people to help. So anyone who would be assisting euthanasia out of Hungary, even family member, would, be, would face criminal charge and uh, imprisonment. So that is something uh, I'm not, I'm, I cannot comment more because it's an ongoing, ongoing case in, in the court and uh, uh, we, we, we have to work on it. But uh, it is uh, another, I would say, important uh, uh, important issue that that uh, academics and other other judges judges national judges should also think about and maybe contemplate on and just give ideas because I, I'm also here to, to learn from you today and thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, please, uh, would you like? Yeah, please. So actually, thank you. Um, actually, I want to address the. Um, Mark's question about what good was all this uh, at the EU. Uh, so a couple, because Hungary's under the same, right? So, and, and pardon me if I do a little EU law speak, but it's Germany, so I, in the US, it doesn't work, but maybe here. Um, so one of the interesting things about all of these things that the European institutions tried with respect to both Poland and Hungary is that whenever Eurostat did its annual survey saying, you know, what has the EU done for you lately, or do you like the EU, or do you think it's a good thing your country is in it? The two countries that routinely wind up being most pro-EU were Poland and Hungary, despite all of that. But I want to say, because of all that, right, which is to say that in, in Poland it's a little more complicated, but in Hungary people forget that, you know, Orban's solid support is about one-third. He gets these super majorities in parliament for a whole bunch of reasons, that are not his base support, okay? Um, and so there were lots and lots of Hungarians who were wondering, what do we do? Like, all of our institutions have been captured. We have no way out. The elections are not free and fair. And so when the EU kept coming in with these various things, even if they were kind of useless in terms of changing facts on the ground, 
it felt to many Hungarians like there was somebody that had their back, you know. And I think in the Polish election, what's re really striking is that, you know, Donald Tusk's party had as its slogan, return to Europe. And that was the winning slogan in the election. So even if these activities don't have a concrete result, um, then I think you know they matter. But here's the where I wanted to just the EU speak. So we, there was a um, a group of lawyers who were convened before the last Hungarian election last year, and they were very worried about this rule of law problem. Right? What if we come in and we have to break all these laws, domestic laws, in order to achieve rule of law broadly conceived? Right? And they took this view that if you comply with European law, you're not really breaking you know, rule of law writ large. So they, they adopted that view. But then they had this view, um, very common among positivist lawyers everywhere, that what if there hasn't been a court decision that has our name on it, right? There are all these judicial independent decisions directed at Poland, but there haven't been so many directed at Hungary, in part because the commission has been asleep, um, but partly also because the, for a variety of reasons, Hungarian law is designed to make it almost impossible to get cases to the ECJ that will raise the judicial independence questions. So then they were saying, well, what do we do if there's no case directed at us? So then there was this brilliant proposal, which is something that I actually think, at first I thought this is like really pedantic and very positivist, and then I thought, maybe there's some hope. What they said was, you know, Hungary can bring an Article 259 action against Hungary. Okay, for EU law speak, that is, there's a possibility of member states bringing infringement actions against member states that are violating the EU, by violating EU law. So here was the idea. The Hungarian lawyers were going to generate, once they got into office, which of course they didn't, Article 259 actions against themselves in order to seek a decision of the Court of Justice that they could enforce at home to prove that they were following the rule of law. Okay, so I, at first I thought that was nuts, and then I think maybe this is a really useful thing that transnational courts can do. Um, and so this is where I just want to say, you know, um, that you know, the, we're counting on the European Court of Human Rights to come down with these good decisions because, you know, there are really audiences in these states, especially the ones that get trapped by autocracy and they don't have the possibility of democratic renewal within. It matters a lot that there are people outside paying attention. Yes, please. I mean, just to, to pick up on that a little bit, and also the question of judicial elitism, you know, what's, what's interesting and uh, I think quite challenging is that when you have then deliberate campaigns that are also designed to construct the transnational court as not only distant but also elite. So when the language changes, uh, as it has done in the United Kingdom, from a European court or an international court to a foreign court. That is about creating a wedge, isn't it? You know, it is about constructing that vision of the European Court of Human Rights as an elite jurisdiction that doesn't speak to us, to our concerns, and thus is about underpinning some of those narratives that are deeply sovereignist, they are themselves elitist, and also creating spaces nationally where you try to close out the possibility that international solidarity or legal act action can in fact flow in and give people something to hold on to, to try to push back against, uh, against the domestic um, setting. And so I think, you know, what's really, for me, there are lots of things interesting about recent legislative developments in the UK, such as the bill that just declare, or act now, that declares Rwanda is safe. You're, it's, n it's not actually, Rwanda is of course in many ways safe, but in terms of a place to send um, uh, asylum seekers uh, in deportation from the United Kingdom, and other actions like this, they are deliberately designed to be almost certainly, or at least prima facie, incompatible with the convention, and thus to create flashpoints, which of course is very familiar from lots of domestic settings. You know, it's very familiar from anti-abortion legal activism in the United Kingdom, for example. Uh, sorry, United States, for example. So you create a certain flashpoint between the state and the European Court of Human Rights on a matter that has been constructed as being entirely about democratic will and the welfare of ordinary people, so-called, living in the United Kingdom. And when inevitably the Court of Human Rights finds a violation, the argument to distance the country further becomes stronger. Uh, so these, I, I think I agree that merely like behaving better as courts is not going to um, 
make people think that courts are less elite, but I think the core point, which is the role of the elitist construction in anti-constitutionist narratives is really important. And to see it also now playing out in terms of transnational courts is very interesting and worrying. If I, if I may just, uh, Mark, uh, what we learned uh, from the last eight years, uh, relations between uh, European institutions and Poland and Polish institution, general uh, comment is that uh, European institution reacted too little and too late. Why it happened? Uh, because it was not understandable at all what is going on in Poland. It was the case in Hungary, but there were, it was explained why Hungary was uh, uh, in the specific situation. But uh, I do remember a conversation in 2016 with uh, lawyers from the European Commission. And uh, I've met them last year. And they commented my comments and uh, statements then. Oh, we've met a Polish lawyer, hysterical, uh, because he presented the scenario how it will be. It's out of any um, possibility to, that it may happen. Why? Because they uh, stand on the principles and they cannot imagine that it is out of any uh, 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 possibility to, to violate it. Uh, secondly, what uh, the Commission learned uh, is that it, the presumption of good faith of the government and the governmental authorities is absolutely uh, false. Uh, bad faith is a uh, presumption of activity of the government. But to accept it is extremely difficult, you know, because it is a reverse of the whole mechanism of your way of thinking. And the third element, indeed, I do remember it, the situation, it was the gathering of the judges, uh, discussion uh, in the office of the Polish Ombudsman, today he is uh, uh, the Minister of Justice, and we got information that the first preliminary question was accepted by uh, ECJ. And we knew from this very moment that the situation is completely dramatically changed, shifted from the political dispute and put it on the legal dispute. And politicians are lost, but uh, not up to the very end, because the politicians in Poland, they refused to execute the judgments, as it was said, of uh, Strasbourg and Luxembourg. Right? And, you know, no accountability at all of these people violating international uh, obligations of Poland. I hope they will uh, be accountable, uh, because otherwise it means that uh, uh, nothing is important and uh, that the, the, the law is not the foundation of the society and state. Uh, next questions, please. Yes, I, I, go. Oh, sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Uh, no, Mariana. That's okay. Uh, no, that's okay. Um, I just wanted to address uh, the question. Is it Mark? Mark. Yeah. So um, just just to build up uh, on build on uh, the, um, the very already insightful answers uh, in the case and to emphasize uh, the fact that I think that courts are like very limited in their capacity to respond to like such threats in particular when we are talking about elections. Uh, as I was saying, as I mentioned briefly during my presentation, uh, you know, right now, the, like the, the, ab ab the abolishing the, the Supreme Court as we know it in Mexico has become uh, an item in the, of the electoral campaign uh, for this presidential election. Um, and actually, I mean, and this campaign like didn't start this week, like it has been going on for the last five years, like with you know consistent attack attacks uh, uh, against the judiciary, and one thing that I find interesting about the the the, the things that the Supreme Court um, has more, most recently tried to do to respond to that in this particular you know political moment um, is to basically they launched a, a campaign 
um, you know, to try to educate the, pro the public about the functions of the judiciary and like what they are actually supposed to do in a constitutional democracy. Uh, but importantly, um, it's, I mean, and, and I actually would like to hear David's thoughts about, you know, like the substantive matter of those type of uh, communication strategies and those campaigns because uh, importantly, the court cannot do any make any promises to to the public, right? Like they like they so courts do like are supposed to defend like constitutional constitutional values and, and principles, but the outcomes of cases are not always going to make people happy, and that's that like that's a very tricky point of you know having a court trying to resist this kind of threats when they have to actually find a balance of the information and the sort of like quote unquote promises that I, that they can make to sort of like tackle also the problem of elitism and sort of like detachment from, from the public. Because I do think that the, that like some degree of detachment from the public, it's also, I want to say desirable in the sense that like if you are looking for impartiality and you know, uh, all these things that we look in the judiciary, you sort of like need some kind of distance. Um, so yeah, in short, not much, they cannot do much, <laughs> and it's very tricky, um, yeah. Thank you very much, and uh, last set of questions, please. Uh, Kuba, one, two, three. Oh, I'm very sorry. Okay, uh, Professor Rubanik. Thank you so much, that, that's been very inspiring. Jakub Rubanik from Warsaw, I'm a legal historian. <laughs> So better an old pot in uh, uh, in, in that pot, but um, I uh, would like to, to ask you if you if you cannot find any sweetness in that story that that Professor Pesikowski has not, and and I, if I may offer um, in that misfortune and hardship, I think in Poland at least one could see a high rise of uh, constitutional awareness during that time. Of course, it it could have gone the exact opposite way, but the people on the street, the reaction to what the government tried to do to alienate the judges even further, and it's not just the international judges, the local judges, like the Daily Mail uh, 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 captioned uh, uh, Lord Justice class Europhile, <laughs> uh, Thomas, sorry, uh, 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 Europhile and, and the enemies of the people, that happened in Poland as well. And on the contrary, we had these slogans on the Supreme Court, that's our court. And just one little example, uh, in the realm of LGBTQ rights, thanks, I, and I'm using that consciously, thanks to that misfortune, LGBTQ rights have become mainstream in Poland. Because the, immediately there was a linkage between the courts, uh, the protection of rights, civic society, civic society that have realized LGBTQ community was part of that. And yeah, so is there any any honey? <laughs> is there any ointment in that story? At least honeymoon for a uh, LGBT community. Yes, please. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for these interventions. I'm actually probably trying to initiate a conversation amongst you rather than asking a single question. And it's, uh, I think I uh, wanted to push back on, on your um, point, David, that, you know, we focus a lot on uh, bad faith and, you know, like intentional, um, kind of retrogression of rule of law, but there are lots of other forms, which I recognize, but I think that judicially and as, as legal scholars, we should be distinguishing between intentional intentionality and bad faith versus other forms. I think that if we kind of say there are lots of other things going on here, I think we might be losing. So I just wanted to get reactions. And I think it just also goes back to um, coming to uh, Mariana's point about, you know, what if we have no good faith actors around the table. So, you know, what are we doing in that kind of situation? So, uh, I mean, I, I think my answer is uh, now it's become a bit of a standard uh, spiel since last night, but I would say that you have to call out uh, the bad faith as well, and you have to kind of take the risk. Uh, but I wanted to see what, what, what you were going with that idea that, you know, kind of you're asking like, what is the point when we have these captures? And of course, I think this really ties in with the transnational element which we must recognize many states don't have the transnational element. We are very privileged here to talk about Luxembourg and Strasbourg and Warsaw, uh, but I think the transnational element, uh, if I may say so, um, in, in, in Europe has, has been actually, uh, I think, failing us in, in really doing a good job. So I wanted to just join in the critique that Fiona had started, but I think we should focus more on intentionality and not maybe just say there are lots of other forms of problems in the world. Thank you. And 
Yes, please. Yeah, thank you all. Um, I wanted to pick up on something which, Fiona, you said explicitly that Strasbourg is behind on reproductive rights. And I detected that a little bit, Kim, in yours. And in the field that I work in on refugee and migrant rights, it's clearly doctrinally behind the Inter-American Court, behind the UN Human Rights Committees. So what do we do about that? I think doctrinally there's a job to do, and I try to do that, always point out where in the Strasbourg case law it has fallen behind the international norm. But it seems to me to be a big problem. Um, and then maybe just to pick up on this discussion about elitism and say, you know, maybe the word is problematic, but courts also need mystique and they need judges to be understood to be highly educated and wise. And so I think some of it is more on the legal academics to engage in public education about the rule of law. And I, I really like Calypso Nicolaitis's book about the rule of law, the history of the best idea and why we have to fight for it. So I just wanted that as a comment. So. David? Yes, please. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for all those uh, questions. Starting in the reverse uh, order, Katrina. I think that courts need mystique, but other people should see this mystique and uh, should kind of you know, have the chance to, uh, uh, to be part of it, at least as listeners, as an, uh, as an audience, which is not often happening. I mean, just an example from the Czech Constitutional Court, it held the first hearing after five years well, if you have one oral hearing in five years, well, then you probably don't care that much what the parties say, right? Because there are quite a few cases where, I mean, a hearing is pretty important, but it, you know, it's extra work, right? Uh, so uh, regarding the claim that legal scholars should, you know, be distinguishing the inten intentional actions, on this one, I'm probably a little bit, you know, skeptical, as you probably know. Uh, even in my work on court packing and so forth, I think that it's very difficult to identify the intent. Uh, it's quite subjective uh, regarding, you know, the case law of the European Court of Human Rights. I think, I mean, some more recent, you know, Article 18 jurisprudence, again, if we expand it a lot, then I think the Article 18 should come, violation should come out with a certain stigma uh, that being something very special, and if we expand it too broadly, then uh, but it, will, it will lose potentially uh, its, uh, its bite. So it's, it's a very difficult debate, intent versus effects versus some irregularity or something else. On structural issues, in a sense, it's a little easier. Uh, but I mean, if you focus on the effects, that's too late because then you can do it on ex post. If you focus on the intent, it's ex ante, but potentially subjective, but there is a danger of, uh, you put it diplomatically, variable geometry. I put it bluntly, double standards. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, if you focus on irregularity, you can have something like that on court packing, but not necessarily on, on, uh, on, uh, on the rights, uh, rights issues. And I think, I mean, regarding the Strasbourg court, more generally, I feel that my feeling is that uh, in the Czech Republic, as well as in Slovakia, is gradually losing support, precisely because of some cases, even among, you know, the, let's say, uh, pro I would say progressive scholars, because they feel that uh, the judgments are not as persuasive as they could be. And I have my own issues with Greta judgment, with Baca judgment. I mean, the Grossam judgment was a disaster because they didn't even get the Czech law right. And uh, there is, a, I would say, growing dissatis dissatisfaction. And most people are looking more at the Luxembourg case law. And one of the reasons is also that the Luxembourg case law is engaging with the scholarship through AG opinions. While you can't see that much happening at the, at the at the Strasbourg court, at least not explicitly, you know, in the in the judgment. So many people feel that different views are not taken uh, not taken uh, into account. And don't get me wrong, I'm a big fan of the Strasbourg court. I've wrote a leading commentary on that, and I'm you know editing the second <laughs> edition, so I'm still a fan. But I can see a growing resistance. Maybe it's a maturity of the system that we are not no longer catching up, you know, with the West and having their own views. But uh, it's becoming an increasing challenge. Thank you. Yes, please. 
so yeah, so uh, on the sweetness point, um, and I do think that that this um, creeping autocracy in many countries has created a broader legal consciousness about the value of of rights and constitutionalism in general. Um, that said, one of the problems with the way that autocracy manifests itself now is that the new autocrats, I mean, I keep saying this is not Hitler and Stalin's scenarios. You know, the new autocrats know those scenarios and they do their best to not look like them. And in particular, uh, there was an alarming survey that was published in Hungary recently um, when people were asked, you know, is democracy in danger? And overwhelming percentages said yes. Equal percentages of Orban supporters and of Orban critics, which is to say that Orban supporters thought democracy was being endangered by what Orban calls the dollar left, the people who were taking foreign funds to undermine the government. So in other words, the new autocrats masquerade themselves as Democrats. They masquerade Orban writes a new constitution. So they're using the trappings of legitimation of real democratic and constitutional regimes you know, and so this has really been very hard to break through. But, you know, I think, and I, and this is a, a responsibility of scholars too. What is the vocabulary we can use? You know, I think Poland was very effective because all these neo judges or fake judges, like they, it's almost like they're walking around with a label on their forehead, right? Because every time somebody's named, you know, the opposition press will say, and this decision was made by a real judge and a neo judge. And then they just kind of keep marking them. And I think that was actually very clever. So I think it, you know, what this shows us is that we have to be more clever than the autocrats. Um, and if I can also just say, um, you know, I, I want to, if I can uh, quote Susanna. So when she became a judge, I remember saying, you know, of course the court gets criticism in any healthy democratic system, a decision comes down and then the academics like eat it alive. And I remember Susanna saying, you know, it would be so much more helpful if the academics wrote before we made the decision. <laughs> And I guess I want to say this as kind of advice to all the academics in the room, right? It's, you can see what cases are coming before courts. And maybe it's worth actually writing the piece and racing it into print. You know, legal blogs are really good for this. You know, fast publication that gets information kind of into the system. You know, and this is where also, you know, opening up, I mean, how many people know that, for example, at the Strasbourg court, you can file you know, um, sort of, you know, briefs that uh, alert the court to broader context, not at the ECJ, I'm afraid we maybe we should fight for this, but trying to get more input to the judges, right, so that they feel like they have coaches, they're not alone, and that there may be some ideas just um, coming that way. And just one last thing, because this is on judging, right? So the question is, like, how do these transnational courts operate? And one really effective thing, I think, that both the Human Rights Court and the ECJ did was they made these decisions on just judicial independence in the, the Portuguese judges case in 2018 in the, in the ECJ, and then in this Iceland case <laughs> uh, at the ECHR. Um, and what was interesting was that they, they took a country that is, I mean, every country's problematic, right? This is a group of critical legal scholars. Okay, so every country's problematic, some more than others. They took relatively less problematic countries and dinged them for things in order to advertise that the door is open to cases coming from more challenged countries. And they did it in these relatively non-controversial cases, I mean, or cases from countries that they knew would comply. So that they had a model for both what the standard was and for compliance. And what that did was that opened the door. And so I just want to say, I agree with Mirek, the European Commission has been painfully too little, too late, missing the boat. They still, after 12 years, have not brought another action against Hungary for judicial independence problems. Still not. Okay, so what happened was that the, uh, the, this um, Portuguese judge's case got all of these still independent judges in Poland to start filing all these preliminary references, <coughs> right? And that's really been the back on which all these cases, the, most of the big cases have come. You know, so one thing courts can do is to say, doors open for cases to come to us and to do that in these relatively non-controversial cases so that they signal to others that there is hope in those institutions. And uh, uh, yeah. maybe, uh, yes, please. Just to, just to um, address the uh, comment uh, by Pashak. Um, I do, like, I, I, I agree with you that, like, the, the guess, like, the easiest solution to, you know, when, when there's been uh, 
uh, breach of these in norms, um, sh like, you know, other actors should call them out. Um, but the issue that I am trying to articulate um, in, in the paper is that, like, there's no, like, uh, in, the, uh, in the case that I'm, you know, focusing on, is that within the party, there's no incentives to actually, like, for party members to call out those behaviors um, in, the sen in the sense that, like, those norms are enforced by your peers. Um, so to the to the extent that like there's no incentives within within the party, then I think that we have a problem not with the courts itself and their capacity or not to respond, but more about like the problem is more about representative democracy, and like how like and I think that like in our like in these discussions, the you know like internal party life, party finance should be at the center stage uh, because. So long as there is no incentives for party members to call out and enforce those norms, um, people will be able to get away with those kind of behaviors, exacerbated by, you know, a, a, a communication uh, ecosystem that basically enables uh, or, um, yeah, exacerbates uh, the the problem. Um, so I'm afraid I don't have any any answers or solutions, but I, I, I guess like it's just a call to sort of like pay attention to this other very important dimension of, of, of the problem. Thank you. Yeah. So very briefly on sweetness, to, I agree with what's already been said. The other thing that I think can be very interesting is when what we conceive of as conventional law work doesn't seem to be succeeding, lots of creativity comes into alternative forms of law work. So in reproductive rights, for example, we've written about it as feminist law work, which includes artistic work, creativity, deliberate breaking of the law, um, you know, all of these things, tickling the law, as some activists call it, and actually creating that kind of legal consciousness work that expands the conception of the institutions and the parties who have a stake in these constitutionalist questions can be quite interesting. And uh, to, to Catherine's point, um, about the court being behind on a, on a number of areas, I absolutely echo making third party interventions. Um, and I acknowledge that there are, uh, for example, in Middlesex, like there are academic groups that are doing this very, very effectively um, already. But I think that that's very, a very useful intervention. I think that there is um, a need generally for the court to re-engage with academics, um, with academic fora um, and had to hold more academic fora in the court. Um, and I also think that as academics, we need to see the other ways into the court. The court is not the only human rights body in the Council of Europe. So there's also the commissioners, there's the committee of ministers, there's other committees and so on. And, so, uh, and the commissioner has been, is way ahead of the court on a number of issues normatively. And there's a new commissioner coming in. Uh, so there's an opportunity to help him to shape his agenda as well. Thank you very much. Uh, very last comment. 35 years ago, exactly, in Poland, round table talks started. Who uh, was a uh, party of these talks? Uh, Il delegalized solidarity movement after martial law, underground, and communist government. And they decided to meet to talk each other. It was not plenty of trust. It was uh, a situation in which uh, the prisoners first time set it in the front of the, uh, the perpetrators. And as a result was political deal, amendment of the constitution, first uh, semi-democratic free elections in Poland, and the process of democratization started. My question is whether today in Poland the situation is sufficiently uh, mature to create a new uh, round table uh, talks. What was back to the mm, institutional forbearance and mutual toleration and mutual trust and a presumption of good faith and intentional uh, 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 violation of the constitution. Division in the Polish society or among Polish society is extremely deep. I'm afraid that uh, it would be probably good 
to start talks um, among whom among those who 35 years ago created the Polish democracy because this is the group of people today completely separated and treated themselves as enemies but it means that maybe it will be time it will come time to to have a talk and to start uh, to to restore Poland as uh, a mature uh, democratic state thank you very much uh, participants for uh, our panel and and sweet sweet information sweet uh, information of organizing. Yeah. We are at o'clock and please do enjoy the lunch. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was, it was really great.